Today's Mom's Day. Happy Mama Day. Mom, I love you so much. You bet. Did you call your mom today? Of course. Okay, good. Yeah, good of course man. I call, I call her every single day. If I don't, she'll kill me. <laughs> uh, no, happy Mother's Day. Today's the last day of our flash sale. This is actually the biggest flash sale we've ever done because we've never done a flash sale with a bundle. And this is for the Build Your Butt Bundle. Yeah, Doug wasn't really excited about that because the bundles are already grossly uh, discounted. And then to turn around and give half off of it on top of that, um, he was a little worried about that. Now, the Butt Builder Bundle has MAPS, Anabolic MAPS Aesthetic, but it also has a mod in there where we programmed out what you can do to turn your glutes back on. Because one of the problems that we have seen time and time again with men and women who don't who can't develop their glutes, it's, it's not necessarily the exercises that they're not doing. It's that their glutes don't fire the way they want them to. So the mod has movements and techniques that turn those glutes back on so that when you go do your deadlifts and your squats and your other traditional exercises, you get more activation in the glutes. And that's included with this. So you get MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Aesthetic, the mod, and it's already discounted, and then we cut it in half again. It's a flash sale, which means it's ending Actually, this is the last day. It's the final day, right? Yep. When this airs. So you go to mindpumpmedia.com and sign up there. If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal DiStefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. Josh Thompson. Great guy, man. Stud. You know what? Did you grow up watching For a guy him? that's been punched in the face a lot, he's a handsome motherfucker. I can't believe how young he looks. He's a handsome he's motherfucker. He's my age. Yeah, no, he's a good looking dude. Yeah. I've, yeah. He's, uh, I grew up watching the guy. He's uh, one of my favorite MMA fighters back in the day because he was one of the earlier like pure mixed martial artists. Like Back when he kind of started, you still had guys that were either just really good grapplers or really good strikers, and Josh is- all of that stuff. And he's very athletic. Like He's the real punk. The real punk, yeah. So you're going to hear us talking to Josh Thompson uh, in this next podcast. Now, you can find him on Instagram at The Real Punk. On Facebook, it's Josh Thompson or Josh the Punk Thompson. And you got to check out his gym. He's actually got a, uh, a, a jujitsu slash MMA slash place where you can work out in San Jose. It's Knox Gym. Uh, and you can look them up online at knoxgym.com. That's K-N-O-X-X gym.com. And he also has a podcast, which is pretty cool. It's called Sammy and the Punk. He, he's re- What's really neat about this episode is if you don't know who Josh Thompson is, his, he's been in like almost every organization, mm-hmm. like all the main, all the big ones. So he had, he shared some great old Dana White stories and uh, the difference between uh, Pride and all those different organizations. I mean, he's had an opportunity to, uh, you know, fight some of the most elite athletes mm-hmm. uh, that have came through the UFC. So, And we got to film uh, some cool exercise moves with him. What's really cool was he was showing us how to do things like use a physio ball to train for jujitsu. And as he's showing us, I'm, we're just like, wow, that's a great exercise. Like, even if you don't do jujitsu... These are great movements for proprioception, for core stability, for hip mobility. So super uh, exciting because Doug actually put together a YouTube series um, that he shot, and it'll be live when this goes live. So when you're hearing this, so make sure you guys run over there, pause this right now, get over to the Mind Pump TV YouTube channel, subscribe to that if you're not already subscribed, and you guys will get a chance to see the series that we put together with Josh Thompson. I got to do a little jujitsu with him, so it's kind of cool. So right. without any further ado, here's Mind Pump talking to Josh Thompson. I did the Blind Date, the show. The UFC had me on the, the show Blind Date. Oh, no <laughs> way. So they had a whole week of fighters. And uh, it was me, Tiki Goshen, Pete Spratt, Tim Sylvia, a couple. Of, anyways, so I show up and then they, you know, they introduce you to your girl that you're supposed to go on this date with. <laughs> 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 you know, and the thing was, we had to do the show, and I'll give you the I'll give you the rundown and the gist on that whole deal. But man, they fucking Dana White just stuck. He called us and he goes, "Hey, you guys need to do this show for me." I was like, oh, man. I was like, Dude, I have a girlfriend, man. I've been with my <laughs> no, girl. Oh no, <laughs> with my girl. Like, doesn't for a while. matter. One of the yeah. guys was married. What? Oh, One of the God. fighters was married. What a dick move yeah. to put so, you guys. But, then go ahead. But so he just made you guys. What yeah, so no, he made us. So like guys like Nick Diaz turned it down. If you notice, Nick Diaz got cut from the UFC right after that. No, no way. Shit. You know what's it's funny? Because of that stupid show. Yeah, because that's because he said no. It, it, when we sign our contracts, our contract says you have to do any PR events that mm. they set up for you. Okay, you can't say no. So he said, yeah. Nick's like, I ain't doing that fucking show. <laughs> 
There's no fucking That's way I'm doing that show. So man. he didn't do the show. But regard what I was trying to say was that we're talking about how we talk about all the topics beforehand. Yeah. When you walk onto the show blind date, they separate you guys. You can't talk. Every time the camera cuts, you're not. They separate you. They grab her and they grab you and they pull you guys away from each other. So you, they catch everything on air. Oh wow, oh, wow! Yeah, they don't. They don't let you guys talk even across. Like they say, no, we want her to look this way. You guys can't even make eye contact. <laughs> they want to capture all those moments. Whoa! Yeah. How so maybe it? that's something you guys should do. As soon as the guest walks in, like, hey, you go over there in the corner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Go in the corner. <laughs> go in fucking the corner. guy. Don't say one word. <laughs> yeah. Wow. We'll, we'll get no. team on you. To I take didn't him realize outside. that they were that so controlling. Oh yeah, hundred percent, man. Like I mean, like and then because I hear a lot of rumors about you hear fighters, you know, some of the fighters, especially after they leave the UFC, like they complain about how they operate, um, and you hear it, and you're not sure if it's is that really what it's like, or are they just saying that because they left and. But it's, I guess, I mean, I, you hear enough of it. It's got to be true. Well, it, it goes for any company like Google. If I worked for Google, right, I wouldn't talk shit about them when sure. I worked there. Sure. It affects my pay scale. <laughs> right? It's the same thing. As soon as guys are more vocal once they leave. But, I mean, they are controlling, but you also know what you're getting yourselves into when yeah. you sign that contract. Let's not be mistaken, man. You're going to pay me, and I'm going to go on this show. I got paid to go on that show, The Blind Date. Mm. But it's like you put me in a really shitty situation. Oh, yeah. I turn to my, I got to turn to my girlfriend and be like, hey, who I was with for years. Yeah. You know, and you're like, yeah, I got to go on this show. And I'm like, I had to explain to her that. Like, literally, everything you saw, that's the only time yeah. we talked. Because I didn't talk to her in between. She's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Oh. You know? But I mean, the point is, no, we didn't We didn't talk. Oh, my God. Because How they want to capture... They want to capture everything. Yeah. So you got to lay this out for us. I didn't even know this was a show that the was UFC she at least did. hot? You know no, I mean? she was hot. What they do okay. is which, that actually okay. makes it worse, bro. I, 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 I'm like, going saying, home and telling I, your girl is like a dime piece that you had to pretend no, to like. What made it <laughs> yeah, worse right, was that they actually do research on the girl or whoever you, uh, girls that you've dated or girls that you're interested in, and they bring in a girl that's like that. This girl just so happened to be like my girlfriend. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> so my girlfriend was like. What the You're fuck? replacing me? <laughs> yeah, she's yeah. like, this is ridiculous. How did they know that you like, you know, this kind of girls? And I was like, well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, honey. Yeah. I was like, analytics. Well, uh, 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 yeah. What, yeah. Is this on, is this on Spike? Where is where do they? Air so them? no, this is an old. This is old. Back in the UFC days, like probably 2002, 2003. Because I was in the UFC in 2000 to 2004. Oh, well, yeah. So you, I fought in UFC 44. I think we're on UFC like 250 right now. Wow. Yeah. And then that, that the two UFC 250 only counts the UFCs that have been like um like what like, pay-per-view like, like pay-per-views and stuff that doesn't count Fox uh, fight nights and things like that so there's way more UFCs that are happening I fought on 44 46 49 and then so on you're an OG for sure I mean you've been oh, doing for this sure. for a long I mean, when did you when was your first pro MMA fight how old were you back I was I just turned 18. 18 years old. Yeah, Holy. just turned 18. You've been fighting that long. Yeah. Not too many people have that kind of staying power. No, no. It's been a long time, man. It's been a long How time. How are you able to do that? Because um, that's a, know, it's a brutal sport. I mean, you're you're, you're going to get hurt, you know? Yeah, I think what happened, I came from a wrestling background, played uh, played soccer a lot as well. So I was always in good shape. I just wanted to train. Um, it's actually a true story. Um, you guys will get the gist on this. Is my my little brother was a wrestler too, and then I was a wrestler in high school. He was he was wrestling in uh, middle school, and um, I had started doing like Muay Thai. My grandmother had put me in Muay Thai. It was after school and I had some time. There was between seasons, soccer and wrestling. So she put me in a Muay Thai and her hairdresser's son had owned this place, you know. So I was like, all right, whatever. I went. And he also taught jujitsu. Well, he was actually from San Jose, the Bay Area. He used to train with Half Gracie. Oh, wow. So he moved up to North Idaho where I was going to high school at at the time. Oh, wow. And she had put me in. And my brother who was a wrestler, he's like, no, I want to do the grappling part. He wanted to do the jiu-jitsu. So I came home one day, and I was bigger. And the be I was the better wrestler at the time because he was still pretty young. I came home. Oh, he used to mess with him. Head snaps, you know, bully him around in the house. <laughs> Boy, I got Typical to his, brother shit. Yeah, I got to his back, and I put my hooks in. I was like Saturday night riding him, you know, like fucking just putting <laughs> heavy pressure on him. And I crossed my feet, and he caught me in a leg lock, an oh. ankle lock. And he, he was that little smart-ass kid that kind of was like this. He's like, oh, what, you want me to, you're tapping? And you give up? Like, he was doing that to me as so he's tapping me. I'm like, ah, ah, I'm like freaking out. Ah, ah, let go, let go. And he's like, no, no, no. Are you ever going to mess with me again? No, 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 no. You know, and putting more pressure, not putting it. So it was one of those scenarios. Like like within a couple of days, I'm like, no, I'm going to take jujitsu. And that's wow. how it started. It all started that way. Yeah. Wow. I mean, as far as the longevity in the sport, it really just comes with like, I've always, I never could afford to eat shit. You know, I always had to just eat at home and whatever I made oh, at I home see. is what I had. And, 
you know, I could never afford, you know, soda and drinks. And it was like, I had to drink water, whatever was in the, came out of the faucet. Luckily I lived in Idaho at the time. So the tap water is drinkable. I'm <laughs> not here, here. Not yeah. here in San Jose. It tastes like you're <laughs> sucking on pennies. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you look young Horrible. too. I couldn't believe your age when you, I mean, I know, I knew your age, but I forgot. Yeah. And I saw you and you're like, yeah, I'm about your age. I'm like, holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I, is that that your, that's your way now? of calling me old. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, we're the same age. So yeah, that was a shit sandwich for sure. Right. How many organizations have you fought in? So I have fought in I fought in all the top organizations around the world. So I fought in the UFC was my first big organization that mm -hmm. I fought in. Fought in Pride and I fought in Dream and I fought in Strike Force. I was the Strike Force World Champion. That's right. Um, you know, and and then I came back to the UFC when the UFC bought and I'm now I'm with Bellator. So I pretty much people ask me like how did I bounce around? But the thing was is that when the UFC got rid of the weight class, the lightweight division back in 2004, I had nowhere to go. I could have stayed in the UFC and fought guys at 170 like some of the lightweights got lightweight guys did. And I was like, fuck that. I've seen Matt Hughes, man. That guy's a fucking huge. Mm. George St. Pierre is huge for 170. How, how much they guys? how 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 what do they walk around at? 210. Oh shit. That's a big cut. That Easily. much of a difference? Yeah. John Fitch, I train with him like f almost every fucking day. Guy walks around 202, 205. Easily. Wow. Yeah. Easily. Big you know, so these guys are making 170. I'm like, dude, I'm not going to 170. You're out your goddamn mind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's no way. Which those one's are, your, which one's your favorite boys. organization of those? Well, it's hard to say because, like, my favorite organization was Strike Force because I felt like we had something. We finally had got something mm. that we had. We had think about all the champions in the UFC right now. We have them. We had, Strike Force had them. Mm. Luke Rockhold, DC, Jacques Array. Like we had Cain Velasquez. Mm -hmm. That's right. Strike, he had his first fight was in Strike Force. Mm -hmm. So we had Verdum, who was the champion who beat Cain, but like he. He was with Strike Force also. Sure, he was in the UFC before. UFC said, "Oh, he's washed up. He's done." They cut him. Then he went to Pride, and then he came to Strike Force after that. Beat Fedor here in uh, Beat Fedor here in San Jose. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like we had all the top guys. We had all the best heavyweights, hundred percent, except for Kane, because Kane went. He ended up going to the UFC, mm -hmm. but we had all the top heavyweights at the time. We had Alistair Overeem. We had Fedor. We had um, what's it called, Verdum. We had Karatanov. We had all the best heavyweights. Paul Bonatello. We had all the best heavyweights at the time. And then when the UFC bought them, they got the heavyweights. And that that kind of sucked, you know, because you had me and Gil as the best lightweights. You could arguably say we were probably the best lightweights in the world at the time because we went to to UFC and fuck, we, he, he could say he arguably beat ben, Benson Henderson. Mm -hmm. Then I knocked out Nate Diaz. And then he, and then I, sh I fought Benson next. And I arguably beat him as well. Fucking split decision loss is the mm -hmm. worst. And I broke my thumb, tore all the ligaments in my wrist, you know, in the first round. I still fought the rest of the five rounds and wow. everyone was so pissed that yeah. I lost. Ugh. Do you see yeah. that being the model? Like, because uh, the UFC... Such I was just going to ask you, why is that? Why do you see the, the hopping back and forth of the athletes and like... What is it about each organization? I mean, it, it can't just be dollars, or is it just dollars? So for me, when I went to Pride, I got into Pride because of Scott Coker. Scott Coker was, he used to, he had a relationship with the Japanese. And the relationship with the Japanese was he used to promote K1 USA. Well, K1 kickboxing, which is kickboxing, K1 uh, Japan was huge, man. It was, it was bigger than Pride, right? Fucking enormous. It was massive. It was way bigger. And it, like on the Japanese side, the American kickboxing just wasn't that big. Mm -hmm. The K1 USA that he used to run, just pe Americans weren't really into kickboxing as much as they were into boxing and, and getting into MMA at the time. So he decided like, well, okay, look, I'm going to get done with K1. Uh, I'm going to fold that up. He had already owned Strike Force. I was fighting after the UFC, after UFC got rid of the lightweight division. I was fighting for... Um, Scott Coker as a kickboxer just to make money, man. Like, I was like, look, I still want to fight. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I was like twiddling my thumbs like, fuck, my career's over, you know. And But in reality, he was like, hey, I'll get you a kickboxing fight. Fighting like, you know, whoever. But still, $2,000 here, $1,500 here. I was like, fuck, better than nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, I knew I wanted to be a fighter. So I fought kickboxing, um, just kickboxing. Then he called me and said, hey, I got to fight for you in pride. Well, at the time... You know, I was the number one guy in the world when I fought my last fight in the UFC against Eves Edwards, and I lost. But it, that that fight should have been for the the UFC lightweight title. 
mm. which is so upsetting because that fight should have been uh, for the title, and then they cut down the division right after that. We were the actual official last fight. Why wasn't it? Explain that. Why they was just it? they they were hemorrhaging money to keep the organization open. Oh wow! Mm. So that's when they started. After I had left, shortly after that, they started the Ultimate Fighter. And they, if you watch the documentary, so with, before uh, that, mm-hmm. they weren't that financially successful. No, no, no. Ultimate oh, Fighter turned it around. Totally. Ultimate Fight, and and had they not had that one fight with Forrest and it, Stefan oh, Bonner, yeah, yeah. that whole thing would have been a fucking. That was loss. massive. How crazy is that then? That because that was an fight, epic. Yeah. I mean, I've watched all the. Ultra, I've watched every season. I've been a fan of UFC since the very beginning when it was underground and uh, you know, and nobody really knew about it. But man, that season when that happened, that was so big. And what a power move for Dana to actually allow both those guys to go in the UFC after that. How could you not right after that? Yeah, fight? no, exactly. It's hundred percent. How are you going to tell one person no? You don't get the six figure contract. You got to be fucking out of your mind, right? Like, I mean, that was a fan favorite fight for years. It's still when they when you go into an arena. I don't know if you guys have actually been to a UFC arena. Yeah, yeah. when they fight, that's the fight that they show when they come out to the um what's that movie shit it's real famous wait they play the song to it the like the bagpipes the bagpipes oh yeah um, Braveheart, Braveheart? No. No, no no not Braveheart no no no, no the no. other Irish movie where they're killing people they're like but oh, man come like, on Justin bro, this is your this is your wheelhouse bro <laughs> the, two, the, two, the two Irish brothers that just kill everybody yes it's uh, it's the, the boondock, boondock Saints, Saints. Saints. Boondock Saints. come on ah, guys geez. oh man come on oh, so, got your name all over that it. hurt my brain <laughs> I was right gonna now. say Highlander and I'm like that's Scottish <laughs> <laughs> oops yeah I'm glad I didn't it's like one of my favorite movies too I should have yeah, known like, that, like, and I've been that is one of my favorite movies yeah but that when you walk into the arena and then they get ready to start the main event that song comes on and that fight comes on yeah, you okay. know, I mean, that's how popular that that's how much respect they still show to that fight because that's really what kept the organization alive. Being in the sport as long as you have uh, from eighteen till now, I mean, that's you've seen it change so much. What are oh. some of the things that just what are I the good things and what about? are the bad yeah. things that you've seen? The good things are that. <laughs> The sport is growing. Kids are now doing it from the time that they start martial arts. It's MMA. You know, I'm not a I'm not a proponent of kids striking to the head, mm-hmm. you know, and doing MMA at a young age um, because now we know a, little, a lot more research and stuff. The studies have shown with the CTE. But I, I just, I want them to know how to defend themselves. Mm-hmm. If you want your kid to stop being bullied, fucking give him some sort of martial art to protect himself. And what I try to tell people that the best two martial arts you can teach your child is jujitsu and wrestling. Because you want to know why? Almost 95% of the fights, kids, they end up on the ground. Right. Mm -hmm. Why not just have your kid learn jujitsu and and wrestling so the kid knows how to take the fight to the ground, get to a submission position, and then wait till the teacher comes to break it up. Right, right. Like, hey, I told him to stop. He didn't stop. I'm holding him here. Yeah. You know, you. I think there was one. There was a. There was this kid bullying this kid. Uh, it's on. It's like a YouTube. Uh, you know, it's on YouTube, and the, it went viral. This like kids pushing him, hitting him, this and that, and the other small little skinny kid drops his backpack and just fucking lights him up. Not mm-hmm. only just lights him up on the feet, but then boom, does like a jumping, swinging armbar, and then he's like <laughs> holding the armbar. He's like, "Okay, look, you done." The guy's like, "Get off me, bitch! Get off me, dude! You're getting fucking armbarred. Why are you talking shit? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean?" But it's like that type of scenario where the kid's like, "Hey, mm-hmm. are you done? Stop trying to, you know, stop trying to fuck with me." Yeah, like yeah. he's got him in the armbar position. The kid can't move. Yeah, you know. Then the kid lets go because when you teach your kids at a young age that that they don't that they can control themselves in that scenario like if you didn't teach the kid that those martial arts and he saw that just off TV he would have broke the kid's arm right but the fact that he's trained in that now he's just thinking to himself I've got him he's not moving mm-hmm. I can wait for someone to come break it up or just until the kid says okay I give up that's one of my favorite things about jiu-jitsu is that you can uh if you if you have to you can fight and you can control someone and you don't have to hurt them in order to win you know, a, a, a confrontation. Whereas if you're teaching your kids boxing or kickboxing, which is fine too, but when they defend themselves, yeah, they're going to be deadly. And in order to defend themselves, they're going to break some other kid's face or nose or whatever. And especially nowadays with the way people sue each other, it's like you don't want to get that letter from you. You, know, you, want, you don't want to get called from the school. Like your kid yeah. just broke some other kid's face. You're like, oh shit. I'm not <laughs> yeah. going to pay for it. <laughs> yeah, I just feel right. like striking is not really the way to teach your child. You know, like, I just feel that jujitsu and wrestling are the main ways. Also, an individual sport like wrestling teaches your kid to grit it out in a 90 degree room when they're exhausted. So what happens, what I've learned, I've worked with a lot of kids actually, as a matter of fact, right before I came here, I had two kids that I was training um, that I do like sports and agility training with them. Mm. But I get them to the point where they're so tired that they 
to the point of exhaustion where they start to cry. Mm. And it's maybe it sounds really harsh, but the reason why kids cry after a competition, not because they lost, because they've exerted so much energy and they still didn't win. Mm. Mm. That's why they have no idea what it's like to be tired. You know, like I've seen kids they run around and run around and run around, right? When they run around and run around, they don't they don't feel it. But all of a sudden you see one time they're like, they're sweating. Like they can stop whenever they want. But when you make a kid go beyond that little bit extra where their body just, they're not used to being exhausted. They don't know what that feeling is where they can't breathe, where their muscles are so tired and they, they don't know what to do. So they just start to cry. And I said, like, it's a normal thing. So teaching a child to go that their body can do so much more because their mind, all their mind has to do is will them to do that. But right. they just have to get used to, they have to develop that by training it and doing it more often. You know, it's funny, you, you talk about that, and when you watch uh, mixed martial arts, the people who are known to be the toughest in the sense of like the grinders, the, the guys that are not going to give up, that are going to fight and keep going, are the wrestlers. They're usually mm-hmm. the wrestlers. Yeah. And people wonder why. Like, why, why is it that the wrestlers are just so gritty and tough? And if you go to like a good high school or junior high wrestling, you know, you go see the wrestling practice and the coach and stuff, if you figure it out, like yeah. at a young age, they understand uh, how to push themselves hard. They understand how to, you know, deal with uh, pain it's and exhaustion. It's mentally, physically taxing. Wrestlers, like ultimate degree, wrestlers yeah. are mentally very, like, like people yeah. who've been wrestling for a long time, they're just mentally very, very, very tough. Especially when you get your hands on somebody at a super high level. Like in order to beat that person, you have to really beat them. Well, you know? and there's definitely an argument too to to take you know kids and athletes to to work on their mental discipline and, and their fortitude and, and and you know kind of establish that in order to then pursue you know greatness. And so uh, there's there's a smart side to training as, as as far as like not getting too exhausted, you know, um, to to lead up into competition, but at the same time like establishing that overcoming mentality. Is, is so crucial to do well the real lesson isn't isn't even necessarily in the exhaustion aspect of it it's in what happens after and how you communicate that you know how you can communicate mm-hmm. that and if you think about fitness like i've worked with a lot of kids too i love working with kids and the thing i love about fitness with kids is that it's such a it's such a nice clear kind of uh example a very small microchasm of what life kind of uh, is like but it's simple right it's just we're moving we're exercising we're running or whatever and then they learn how to deal with that. And then those lessons actually have a lot of carryover into everyday life. So when they, you know, their girlfriend breaks up with them or life, you know, they lose their job or whatever, they just, they have that, 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 that skill. Well, Josh, I want to, I want you to go, I want to go back again to the, what, what you've seen, the good and the bad of the evolution of the sport. I, I don't know if you listen to Fighter and the Kid or how well you know, like Brendan Schaub. I know he mm-hmm. talks a little bit on his show about that. What are your thoughts on, on the evolution of the sport and, and UFC and, and, and specifically talking about them and where, where it's gone and where it was? Like, what do you like? What do you don't like? Um, there's, there's so many different, there's so many different things. I loved when it was five, six shows a year, but then I understand the importance of having it more often. Mm. But I also don't like how it's Every weekend, sometimes two shows in a weekend, three shows. Now you're taking the importance of the athlete who's grinded their whole life away to become popular and become a star. There's, there's no, they're not, they're not stars anymore. So back in the day when there was five to seven to 10 shows a year, right? It was special. To make that card which, was a big yeah, deal. Yeah. Well, not just that, not just to make that card, but then when you knew where you were signed with the UFC, you knew you were a number one, you knew you were a top talent in the world. Mm. Now they have shows every week. And like, I think uh, about a month ago or two months ago, they had a show in Germany and they had a show in Brazil in the same night. Whoa. Like literally both shows were the same night. And then they had a show the next night here in the US. So three shows all within a 24 hour period. Now they did it because of the time change. You're not going to watch the show in Germany at the, you know, right. at eight o'clock without already seeing the news and seeing what the results were and blah, blah, blah. And it was on fight. It was on a fight pass. Mm. But um, I just, I see that you're, what happens when you when what happens is when it grows so when it grew so fast, now there's no stars, and when there's no stars, the the fighter doesn't get treated the way that they should. The athlete doesn't get treated the way they should. Okay, I think that's the problem that you're seeing right now in college football. They're like, hey, my jersey was the number one selling jersey in the world. Why am I not getting anything for this? Like I'm struggling to like paint to, to wash my damn clothes. Yeah, you know, and I'm not getting paid for this. You know, it's like you're making all this money off me because you gave me a a thirty five thousand dollar education. 
you know, but I'm going to be gone in a year. Yeah. You know, that's why I'm leaving to the NFL. That's why I'm leaving to the NBA is because I'm a one-off because I'm going to make my money, get out. I know I'm a, I'm a draw. I'm going to go to the NFL and make money. I just see that in the, the select that Dana, Dana and the Fertitas had did a good job of making sure that Dana was the star. When Chuck had left, he was the last big star that they had. Mm-hmm. Chuck, Randy, mm-hmm. that was it. He was like, because I don't know if you guys know the history on Tito and uh, Chuck. They used to be managed by Dana. Mm-hmm. So when oh, he, I didn't know they were managed by him. Yeah, Dana was their manager back before they had bought the UFC. So he had turned and said, that. hey, um, when he had met the Fertitas, they, he knew that the UFC was for sale. So he had turned to the Fertitas and said, hey, this I think there might be something here. The Fertitas said, you know what? You might be right. So- They've decided to buy the UFC and they ran on it with that for a while. <clears throat> but um, I think what Dana and them have done is what better way to make sure that you're always staying focused on the UFC is to make Dana the star. Because mm-hmm. Dana's not going anywhere. He ain't going to lose a fight. Got, no, he's got money <laughs> invested. He's not going to lose a fight. And he's going to always be there. No way is he leaving that organization. He's got, he owned 10, 12, 15, I don't know what the percentage was, but he owned percentage of the company. He's not going anywhere. The other thing that you're going to do with him is you're going to make other guys, um, the other people you're going to make celebrities, the ring girls. Bro, have you seen the following yeah, those true. ring girls have? Yeah. And I'm not knocking them for being what, you know, for being what they are. I think it's great. But these ring girls have got, you know, 800, 1 million, 1.5 million followers oh just God. making money hand over oh, fist. Oh, that would actually be really frustrating and if hell. you're a fighter in there getting your ass whooped, man, yep. and fighting for your life and you got girl, ring girls and making more money. you got ring girls making more money than you. It's the worst thing when you get on a plane as a fighter, right, that makes this company and you get on the plane and you're walking past first class and all the ring girls are sitting oh, there. Oh, God, that would piss me <laughs> off. Come on. Oh, it's got to be demoralizing to them. I've been blessed enough to like make enough money to like, yeah, sure, I'll upgrade. Mm-hmm. You know, but there's times where I'm like, I'm only going to LA. It's like a hour flight. I'm not upgrading to first class yeah. for an LA flight, like whatever. You know what I mean? But I've gotten on planes to get on. I've gotten on. It's like, there's Joe Rogan sitting there and there's, you know, the ring girls there and there's buffer there. And you're like, you're walking past first class and you're just like, man, that sucks. That's a motherfucker <laughs> yeah, right there, sucks. bro. It, you know, especially when you got guys that are like the co-main event on the card and you're walking right. past these, these ring card girls. Sometimes what's even worse is when you get on a plane and you're in the you're waiting to get on the plane and you're checking your Instagram and you see the ring card girls are flying private. <laughs> wow, oh, God, thing. dude! Yeah. And I'm not knocking them. I'm no, not, no, no, it's just like I'm just more saying power repeated them. hits in the nuts. Yeah. And for the athlete that is making this all possible, it's really upsetting. Yeah, you know, it's got to be frustrating. I've actually, and then never- they take away your gear. Uh, on top of that. Yeah, right. With I mean, these like, other deals. That, yeah. People don't seem to understand what that Reebok deal did. That Reebok deal has killed between sixty dollars to $80,000 every fight I made. Damn, what? Damn, dude. Yep. Easily uh. sixty dollars to $80,000. Whoa. So Whoa. now, when I le- when I was there, my last fight with them was the Reebok deal. I only had one fight with them under the Reebok deal. I made five grand. I had 10 fights in the UFC. I made five grand. $5,000 for five. $5,000. Wow, dude. That's insane. Horrible, man. Whereas before that, you were making- I was making 60 to 80 just in sponsors. Just in sponsors. That's not kind of my purse. Yeah. Holy cow. Do you think this move to Bellator was really like after that whole uh, deal went down? Do you think it was more appealing that way? My move to Bellator was strictly because I knew Scott Coker. I'd had a relationship with Scott Coker. Scott Coker's the reason why I got into Pride. Mm -hmm. When I wasn't with the UFC anymore, when they didn't have a lightweight division, he's the one that got me into Pride. I got paid good money for for that fight back in the day, more than any of the other guys had made. Then I came back and he started Strike Force. He gave me a great contract. I was making more than I had, almost triple what I had made in the UFC fighting wow. guys like awesome. Ed Edwards, Hurt Me Franca, being the number one fighter in the world. He paid me more money and he had broke down the rule, like literally what he was going to do with Strike Force. I'm going to sign Frank Shamrock, Kung Lee, and they're going to fight. I'm going to sign you, Josh. I'm going to sign Gilbert Melendez and you guys are going to fight. Okay. And then I'm going to build everything around you guys. Mm hmm. And that's exactly what he did. Cool. Wow. So how do you get mad at someone who's actually a stand-up guy and says and does exactly what he said he was going to do? Wow. Right. Now, I mean, the counter-argument, of course, from people who you know, represent the UFC, they'd say, well, hey, we make it all possible. You know, if it wasn't for us, it wouldn't be this big. And then you hear them say things like, we've got these other stars who make shit tons of money, right? We've, we're paid, you know, Ronda Rousey all this money. We paid, you know, Conor McGregor all this money. Uh, you know, what's your counter to that? I love Ronda Rousey. Yeah. I love Conor McGregor. I think they're amazing for the sport. I'm all for them making that money. 
Okay, I just don't see why the other guys can't make a little bit more. I was just gonna yeah. say there's probably yeah. a huge discrepancy between them. Oh, massive! And then the next top five. Oh, it's it's like less than point zero one percent. You Damn. know, so if you want to take like the guys in the NFL, sure, maybe you only like say five percent or like less than that make you know what Tom Brady makes mm-hmm. and those yeah. guys make. I get that LeBron, he's making the most. Okay, mm-hmm. everyone understands. Yeah. Yeah, I get those guys. Yeah. yeah, but there's two or three of those people in the UFC on a 500 person roster. Mm-hmm. You know, there's only two or three of them in the NBA. They're all fucking millionaires. Yeah. Oh, you know, know what I mean? Like sometimes like. Even even the the practice squad guys for the NFL make more than these guys make. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the practice yeah. squad. Yeah, man, we talking about practice? You talking about practice, man? <laughs> talking about <laughs> practice? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. even these guys, even like even those guys are making more than these these guys that are fighting their ass off. Mm-hmm. What people don't understand is that I, I grew up on the east side of San Jose here in San Jose. Mm-hmm. Okay, I went to Mayfair back when it was called Mayfair, and now it's called Cesar Chavez. And I went to Matson for a year, and then I went to Joseph George, and you know what I mean? Like, I went, I, I grew up on. On the east side. You know where Pink Elephant and King and Story is? Yeah, yeah. I grew up mm-hmm. right there. Literally one block away from Pink Elephant, the Mercado mm-hmm. of the Pal Stadium. I grew up right there. You know, I used to walk to school. Grandmother used to watch me walk to school from the sidewalk because I lived on the same street as Mayfair and Matson. I grew up right there, man. Yeah. Like, we came from it. Like, she'd wake me up and make oatmeal. Like, that was, I had oatmeal every morning for breakfast, man, or beans and rice with some eggs. Like, dude, that was my life. Yeah. Like that's so the fact that now that I'm able to make a little bit of money and be able to do these things, I'm like, man, I'm not having beans and rice no more. Fuck this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but yeah. it, you know, it's good with my enchiladas and tacos. You know, <laughs> but I'm not having it for breakfast and dinner. You know, yeah. but um, these guys have learned. To, they've come up the way that I came up, and I see. I know the struggles. I know exactly what they're going through. Mm. And I feel bad for them because the UFC has shifted to stars and the reason why I feel like they shit to the stars because they don't have the control like they did over Chuck and, and yeah. Tito and you know because they had a re- they didn't control Chuck but they he had Dana had a relationship with Chuck that gave him a little bit more leeway to do what he wanted he knew that if he they told Chuck like hey can you do this appearance for me really I need you to come through for me he'd be like yeah sure because you know Chuck was a stand up guy Chuck's one of my best friends man mm, nice. I say in the industry at all Chuck's one of my best friends he's one of my favorites yeah, him and totally. Randy were two yeah. of my absolute favorites yeah. you know what uh, what kind of advice did you, if there's someone coming up uh, and trying to get into this sport um, and do it professionally, what what advice would you give them to be able to, to for them to make the most money? Obviously, people say win fights, but that's not always true, right? Because you've got people who are don't have as good of records, who aren't you know fighting for championships that just earn a shit ton of money because they have a, a lot of a high draw. Like, what what would you recommend to people? Let me ask you this: Do you guys watch Sage North Cut? No, mm-hmm. Okay, so he's like, uh, it's like a karate style. Yeah, kid. yeah, he's that young, good-looking, like, yeah, shredded young, kid. Good-looking kid, yeah. shredded. You know, yeah. but how would you feel? He's got like two or three fights, I think, in the UFC. Yeah. I think he's got four now. Okay, but he's got, I think he's, I think he's two and two or three and one mm-hmm. or uh, one and three. Mm-hmm. Sorry, he's got one win or two wins. Yeah. you know. Anyways, how would you feel if you were had? Let's just say you were one of the guys that were lightweight. You're like one of the top guys, and he's making fifty and fifty. And yeah. you're making 43 and 43. Mm. Yeah. How would you feel? Yeah, like, so, let's yeah. just say I'm ranked in the top 20. Yeah, this right. kid's not ranked in the top it's 20. It's not about the sport at that point. Yeah. yeah, it's not a sport anymore. It's like you're literally pushing guys in front of me that don't deserve to be there. It's because they're marketable or whatever. They're, they're going supposed for that, to be marketable, right? yeah. but let's talk. Well, I, I want to see. I'm talking about fighters, man. Yes. Yeah. Man, like you want to be a fucking fighter? Let me see you be a fucking fighter. Okay. When you find, when you find guys that. That lose the same way every time. You know they're not a fighter. Mm-hmm. You guys understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. If if the guy gets kicked to the body and he runs to the fence every time he gets hurt, he runs to the fence and covers up and puts his hand out and waits for the ref to stop it. That's someone who is he's not a fighter. Mm-hmm. Somebody who just basically gets tapped every time, same almost same uh, submission or whatever it is. Okay, that's not a fighter. Okay, sure, maybe you're athletic. Sure, maybe you're. Uh, you're someone that has all the looks and all the the attributes to be a fighter, but you don't have it mentally. You're mm-hmm. not you're not a fighter. How no, prevalent a, is that in the industry? Is there do you think that there's a lot of that? How like a majority, half, how how much of that? Well, I think it's a new generation of guys that are coming up. It's I don't want to call them the millennials of MMA. But, <laughs> but we're know, gonna go well, ahead and do term, that. Though, you know on. what I mean? It's kind of a it's kind of a because what it is, they jumped in when they saw the money and the stardom was going up. Yeah. They jumped in, now they're in it. Which is good, and they have the look and the flashiness and the and everything. But then when it comes down when the when the going gets tough, they just kind of they they kind of find ways out. Mm. You know what I mean? So they, when you when you say that, that makes me think that 
man, what's that we're going to see this transition in the next five or so years of like uh, kids that were like in their young teens that have built like a large social media presence that come into the UFC that are actually going to probably get a fast track towards, you know, the top and getting paid well because they can't, I meet Dana White and I've already got 40,000 followers that follow me because I've built this social media presence, whether I'm good looking or fit or I know somebody, but now I, I have that going for me and now I'm in the sport. There's probably a good chance I'm going to make more money because of that. Is that true? Uh, yes. Uh, but let me ask you this. How does a guy like Rory McDonald after a fight like he had with Robbie Lawler Get let go. Yeah, Didn't I, get let go, but was able to even fucking leave. Yeah, yeah why? How are you even able to negotiate with another company? Why did that happen? You got to be out of your fucking mind. Huh. Yeah. You I, know, and I, there's a lot of talk right now that Jacare and Musashi are both on their way out to hmm. Bellator. Wow. They, they, Jacare fights, uh, did he fight? He fights this weekend. Hmm. Okay. He fights this weekend. He's on his last fight of his contract. Musashi has one more fight left, or he just fought, what, two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. I think he's done now. So he, they're gonna, he's going to go and negotiate. He's got like a 60-day non-negotiate. He's got to, to only negotiate with the UFC for 60 days. So you have that period where you have exclusive rights to negotiate with just the UFC. But he's going to wait those 60 days. He's already come out verbally and said, like, I'm waiting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see the free market agent, which they all should do. A hundred percent, they should all do. That's exactly what I did. I think if there's two companies, find out exactly which one's willing to pay you the most. <laughs> I don't give a shit who you are. Right. Okay, if you're an athlete... Fucking invest in yourself. There's nobody else going to invest in you but you. Fucking fight your fights. See what the market is. If it's not there, there's no way the UFC's letting him go. Like if you say, hey, he's the offer of shit money still going to be on the table. Right. They're not going to let you go. Be, you know, <laughs> the shit money's still going to be there. I just chose to go with Bellator because the money was substantially more. Not just substantially more, but the, sh the show money was substantially more. So let's just say if you had a chance to make... 60 and 60 or 70 and 70. You understand what that is? Yeah, what, 70, 70 so to fight, each, 70 each, to win or whatever. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So okay. 60,000 to show up and fight. Make weight, show up and fight. Then another 60,000 if I win. That's a big... That's a big drop if you don't fucking win. And then on top of it, did you train any less hard for that fight? No, of course not. Exactly. So then second though too, is what happens if I get poked in the eye and it goes to a fucking no contest? I don't get paid the, the win money. Yeah. Uh, mm. If it's a draw, you don't get paid the win money. If wow. it's a no contest or a legal growing shot or something like that, you don't get paid the win money. So you're, both fighters don't get paid the win money. So you're, you're fucking ripping them off again. We're Bellator's contracts. And I'm not just being, I'm not just saying this. This is how Strikeforce was as well. Is that... They are, um, they're heavy on the show money. So like if I show up and fight, I'm getting 120,000 or 200,000 to, to show up and fight. And then like a $30,000 win bonus, mm. you know, or an, an, or no win bonus, but a finishing bonus. If I knock you out or submit you, I get a hundred thousand dollar finishing mm -hmm. bonus. Like we're, you're talking, it gives me incentive to push and try and get the, the finish, mm -hmm. but I'm still getting paid Fucking great money. Yeah. I was just yeah. gonna say until you said that, I was gonna say, well, then I would I would be worried that some guys would just well, whatever. I'm not gonna train very hard because I don't care if I win because I have such a big purse. So I get what the UFC would do there. But then you said that right there that you get a purse for yeah, you get a per you get a you get a, your show money is higher. Yeah, which I understand what you're saying. Yeah, like all oh, the show money is higher, so people just don't give a shit. Yeah, yeah. But then if I turn around and say, hey, I'll give you another say fifty grand if you get a finish. Yeah. It's if you get a submission, you're going to fight harder. Oh, yeah. yeah. Not just a win, a finish. If yeah. you get a finishing bonus, I mean, fuck. Right. You well, know? I, you know, I think... You uh, go for it. I yeah. think today, uh, you know, you can be a really smart, I guess, businessman with yourself because of things like social media and whatnot. Like, I... I look at like, like we're in fitness, we're in the fitness industry. And back in the day, if you were, I don't know, Mr. Olympia or you could make a lot of money and you probably made more money than everybody else because you were, you were first place. Today, the highest paid athletes in fitness are the ones with the most social media followers. So I'm wondering if fighters can start to figure that out as well. So although you, you go in there and maybe you're just, you're entertaining or when they interview you, you know, you talk a certain way or whatever, just so you get those followers and build yourself as a business and that might give you some autonomy. You know what I mean? Then you have the power. I, th I agree with you hundred percent. I think if I was just, your original question was, what would I tell somebody who yeah. is coming up in the sport in this generation? I would say you need to film and, and, um, have someone archive everything that you've done. Okay. And not just for a later date, 
but because as you're going through your workouts from everything, the most views and the most viewership stuff that I get is things that I'm doing in my personal life. Oh, wow. yeah. And I'm not, I don't like to show, I don't, I don't share my personal life with anyone, but mm-hmm. when it comes to my training, when it comes to my running the mountains, when it comes to my mountain biking, things like that, that's fine. But my home life is my home life and it's separate from my family. You won't see me at my family Easter party posting yeah. pictures and things like that. Well, that's, that's my, the difference between our generation and the younger yes. ones. We don't, we don't post like our kids and shit like that. A exactly. Lot. That's what that's, everybody does now. Yeah. And I get really, I actually get like disturbed when I see like friends of mine, they're posting pictures of their kids. I'm like, dude, that's funny random people. I literally have had in San, in San Jose, I've had people just knock on my door. Hey, can I get an autograph? Oh shit. My yeah. home. I'm like, how the fuck did you fight me? Yeah. Wow. I, I've paid, I've paid all the, the dues. I, I actually went on all the, on the internet and I've actually had my stuff removed from everything on the internet. You can't find me anymore, but it only lasts a year and you got to redo it again. Mm. Every year you got to do it. I'm like, fuck, how did someone find? Because I'm getting mail at my, I, every once in a while I get oh, mail at my God, house. God, that would trip yeah. me. Wow. Get fuck fan out. mail. So what I do with the fan mail, I don't send it back because then they know they had the right address. <laughs> so I don't send it back. I'm like, no. But anyways, I'm trying to keep my, I keep my life personal. But as a young athlete, I would tell them to, um, to just archive everything. Like just f- record anything you possibly can. You know, and let people view it. Like, but I would start it on a, like a YouTube channel mm-hmm. where you can make money doing it that way as well. Mm-hmm. Once you hit a yep. certain amount of subscribers, once you get a certain amount of views, because one of your things may just go viral. Like my buddy, uh, Shane Faison, who does fight tips. Mm-hmm. He just did that video yesterday about the guy being drugged across the jiu-jitsu yeah. match. That was his video. Oh, wow. So he did that video, fucking went viral. Boom. Like, <laughs> This and it was just, the, he was making fun of the he United. He was making fun of the United where yeah, the guy's yeah. being drugged like through the thing and he's just showing the escapes. <laughs> Jiu- <laughs> Jiu-Jitsu escapes. What a great brilliant. video. Oh, how to, brilliant. How to attack from that position. It was fucking awesome. Man. Wait, yeah. wait. These aren't the, this wasn't the, the Gracie ones because they made a video too. Was the, No, the no. So it, it so it was, but he did it with them. Oh, he was the so one that was saying, yeah, yeah. That video is fucking brilliant. I was yeah. cracking awesome, up right? when I was watching that exactly. one. Exactly. That's wow. excellent. Yeah, Has, how You were just talking about how you film a lot of your training and stuff. Has it changed through the years now that you've been doing this for so long, does your training look different now than it used to? A hundred percent. Because as you get older, you know, your training's got to change. Your body changes on a, on a weekly basis. What's man. the difference? Um, I, the so, so some of the differences is that look, when I was 28 to 32, I would just train like a fucking animal. Mm-hmm. There was never, there was never a moment where I wasn't fucking training. Mm-hmm. Like I would wake up at 6am. I'd fucking go do an assault bike class at my, like at my own gym. I would just fucking train as hard as I could go back home and just sleep, eat, sleep, you know, shower, get, get up for noon training with the fighters, fucking train two hours with them, whether it was wrestling, jiu-jitsu, sparring, whatever it was, you know, and then I would come back and I'd go back home, eat, shower, sleep, and then wake back up 6.30 at night, I'd go back to the gym and just fucking train until Damn. like 9 o'clock, 9.30 at night. And whether did it was, this all the time. Whether it was kickboxing, bike workout, Savage. you know, or sprints on the machine or whatever it was, you know, and it would change, you know, th- like throughout the week. But as I got older, it was like, okay, look, two workouts a day and that's it mm-hmm. because your body just can't do it, man. I'm like, no matter how clean I eat, no matter how, you know, I even brought a nutritionist in like that stay with me and live with me. I don't know if you guys know who Dan Leith is. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, uh, he does Lockhart Leith. So he's the nutritionist for myself, Kane Velasquez, DC, all these guys. Okay. And, um, so I've had, um, I, I had him actually just move in with me. He makes, you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner, everything. He gets you all sorted out and, uh, he lives with you while you're in camp. Oh, wow. And so he just takes care of everything you need. That's awesome. And because there's certain times you need to have your macros, certain times you need to have, you know, your sugar, sometimes certain times you need to have your carbs more, more on the certain ratios too. Like after mm-hmm. you do a hard workout, you want more of a three to one ratio, sugar to carbs mm-hmm. and that type of thing. So he keeps track of all that because when you're in camp, you want it to be mindless. You know, I want someone to can do everything. You just want to focus on the you training. Just, right? You just want to focus on the training. Like I can't, my mind can't be working, you know, and and trying to get the best out of my performance if it's not focused on the one thing I'm supposed to be working on. Now, with your training, do you do put more time now into things like mobility, flexibility, or, or like <laughs> massage and that kind of shit now? So with the massage, yes. But the uh, the mobility, no. And I hate to say it. It's the <laughs> worst fucking thing <Really>? ever. <laughs> I, something happened when I hit like 34. 
my flexibility just shit took a shit on me. Really? <laughs> it's not as what it used to be. And you know, it just sucks, man. I don't know what it is. I need to spend more time on the actual mobility stuff. Gotta be hanging out with Brink more, huh? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And he's always on me about <laughs> I'm sure he's it. Yeah. Drilling you on he's that. always on me about oh you gotta do something. I can't even fucking touch my back. You know, it's uh, like <laughs> gotta, I gotta get off the toy, put one leg up on the thing and try and wipe my ass that way. <laughs> you know, it's like can't do the reach back anymore. It doesn't oh, it doesn't man. happen, man. I gotta it's it's crazy. Now, what are the advantages that an older fighter would have over a younger fighter because there's got to be some advantages too because i remember randy couture was whooping the shit out of these young kids right and he i'm sure there was disadvantages but there's got to be some advantages. so what i try to say about with randy and with dan henderson they're yeah there's another anomalies anomalies so what happens randy was so good at wrestling his game plan was always the same if you ever watch his fights they were always the same yeah it was punch punch clinch press you to the fence Get the takedown if you can. If you can't get it, just, just keep, you, <laughs> keep you against the fence beating you up. He never stood on the outside. I used to hate to that because like, I was a Chuck fan, man. I was, yeah. such, I was a yeah. diehard Chuck fan, and those fights yeah. would just drive yeah. me crazy. Like, fuck, you know he's going to do that, yeah, dude. Exactly, yeah. exactly. But no one could stop it yeah. because that his whole, his whole game plan was to do that one thing, and it's been his game plan ever since he started fighting. But um, and this, the thing with Dan Henderson, sure, he was the same way. But as he got older, he started relying a lot on just his power. Mm-hmm. And the, that's just something you it doesn't care. If, I don't give a fuck if he's 60. His fucking power is still going to be there. The guy's an animal. He's is that fine. true? We hear that. Like you, you're, That's the last thing you lose yeah. is your the strength The last thing you lose is your power. Yep. Wow. And for smaller guys, that's why there's such a big turnover in, um, in sports for smaller guys. Because the first thing to go is your speed. Oh, once that's your speed's strength. gone, that's once your thing. speed's gone, the younger generation of uh, fighters, God, what a great are gonna fuck you up. What a mm. great point! As a you heavyweight, know? you can probably carry your uh, heavier classes. You yep. can probably stay a little bit longer because you can rely on that. See, power. I've experienced yeah. some of this before because I've actually, you know, I've done a little bit of sparring. And uh, if you've ever been hit by like a fifty-year-old boxer, you see the guy and you're like, oh, he's a fifty-year-old boxer. And he'll fucking kill you. Like, yeah. he'll hit yeah. you <laughs> like a car hit you. And you're like, well, this is He hits isn't... the soul out of your body. Yeah, it doesn't make yeah. any sense. But that's, I guess that's true. That's because you hear, always hear that, right? Have you seen that video that's viral uh, with the old boxing guy? He gets in the cage or he gets in the ring with this guy, this younger kid. Yeah, I, I, think, it's in, I think it's in Russia or yeah, in, like Italy or something like that. Puts his ass to sleep. And he fucking slaps him. Yeah. Just puts him <laughs> out, man. The kid's like giving the look like whatever. Then the, the old man hits him, boom, boom, a couple big <laughs> shots. And people are kind of like giggling and laughing like oh you know poor old man and next you know he just fucking slaps the guy sits him through the rope <laughs> and they have to like pull him off they have to pull the old guy off the young guy they're like pulling him back and he's like ah whatever <laughs> you know it's like the old Thai Ripper guys snapper. Yeah, yeah it's like the old Thai guys that are they're like okay like you're gonna go spar with the young kid so the guy like throws the fucking cigarette out of his mouth steps on it walks in there and just knocks the kid out <laughs> <laughs> So, any other adva- are there any advantages though to be able to do you think? Well, you, like, are you smarter? In I would the think ring the me- I would think the, like the, the the mental confidence, the experience, right? Right? You the probably experience. walk in like no big deal. I've been in here a million times. Yeah, the experience does play a factor. You pretty much have seen it all. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, the game changes a little bit, but doesn't change that that drastically mm-hmm. to understand. But I think what it, it, it's I wouldn't say there's any advantages other than that. I mean, mm-hmm. like. Just the experience. I mean, if you're an older fighter, you just got to use what you know and use what you know best. Like, that's the thing. It's like, don't try and do anything outside the realm because you're fighting a younger guy. Mm-hmm. You know, the issue with the thing with the, the younger fighters, you, you, the older fighters with the younger ones, you have to weather their storm mm-hmm. because they're going to exert so much energy so fast in that first round. You got to get through that first round. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And once you get through that first round, that's when you slow the pace of the fight down to your level of experience where you can just, okay, I got this. Wow. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about the psychology uh, of fighting. Uh, how important is that uh, to being a, 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 to be able to win? Well, it depends on which one you're talking about. You're talking about the millennial MMA guys, or are you talking about the the ones that are real fighters? Well, anyway, like any of, I mean, any of them. Like, what is a winning psychology? Like, what are some of the challenges going in? I mean, I've I've never fought uh, in in MMA. I've never I've competed in grappling, uh, you know, competitions, jiu-jitsu and judo, as a kid, and I distinctly remember um, being exhausted going into my first match because I was so too hyped. I was too hyped and too nervous and whatever going in that I would just get exhausted, like way worse stamina mm-hmm. than I did when I would train. And I couldn't figure it out. And as, as I got older, I figured it out because I was too amped. Like, let's talk about some of the psychology going into a fight and what are some of the things that you need to, I guess, look out for or focus on. So if someone is just coming up or what I try to tell people is that you're never going to be able to train as hard as you're going to fight. Mm. Because I could spar as hard as I can. So like, let's just say I get ready for a three round fight and I get a fresh guy every round and they come in, they're 
fucking world be- world beaters, right? They just come in, they're just trying to take my head off. Doesn't matter. I'm still not going to fight at the pace that I'm going to fight if I was fighting somebody else in the ring, mm-hmm. for real. It's just something happens when you get out there. Different switch. It's huh? just a different switch on both ways. There's nothing you can do about it. But you can try and do the best you can out on the track, you know, in your workouts, you know, and whether whatever type of workouts you do. And um, in your sparring, you just try to always push the pace, always keep the, the grind on. But you're never going to get that that true fight feeling until you get in there and fight. Mm -hmm. And like you were saying, you were exhausted before your tournament. Um, But the reason being is because it's just lack of experience, Mm -hmm. learning how to rest and and learning how to relax right Mm -hmm. before. That's the biggest thing. I mean, shit, I've been fighting for almost 20 years now. I mean, like I go out now and it's like, I don't even trip now. Like I have, you know, I've got my boys in the room, in the locker room with me. We're just jumping rope, talking shit, you know, and then I get ready to walk out there, mm-hmm. fucking get it, get it on and move on, collect my check and bounce out. Do you remember a transition of that? Like, was were, was there a time when you were super nervous, overthinking, and then you kind of, something happened or you just over time? Yeah, I would say it was that way for all my fights up until my, after my first fight in the UFC and I got the jitters out of like, you know what, I've made it. You know, like once you're in the UFC and you've got that first win in the UFC, it's like, oh, I fucking made it. Hmm. You know, because until you get that first win, which most of the time at the time was only the biggest organization in the world, Mm -hmm. you know, it still is. But I'm saying that it was like the only one It's the only one. So once you got that win and you're like, oh, fuck, like a a sense like a huge monkey off your back, just a sense of relief. Do people uh, knowing that you're a fighter and you're recognizable, do people mess with you? In real no, life? not anymore. When I was younger, they did. Really? Mm. Because the sport wasn't as prevalent as it is now, so it wasn't as big. So when people would actually, like, oh, yeah, I heard you're a fighter, and they would talk shit, like, oh, you do that UFC shit or whatever, you know, like they would say things like that. But now, fuck, you go to all the clubs around San Jose, all the fucking guys that work the door, they're all trained jiu-jitsu, and they all fucking, <laughs> yeah. they all know yeah. who the fuck I am. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I don't have any problems. Like, literally, it's like, hey, get that guy out of here because he's fucking with me. And they're like, yeah, sure, no problem, Josh. <laughs> get out, dude. You have, you, have you had to do anything? Like, in, like, has anybody ever actually? When I was younger, yeah. I mean, like, really? I, I, I got in a lot of fights when I was younger, man. Really? It's very unfortunate. Um, Even before a, you were training? Like, when you were younger? Especially young? before I was training. Really? Mm. Is yes. that what motivated you strongly? To, were, you, were you bullied? Were you, a, like, a small so kid? So when maybe? I was young, I grew up on the east side. I'm, like, half white, half Mexican. I grew yeah. up on the east side. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> I look more white than I, did, uh, I am Mexican. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I got bullied all the time. It's mm. like people trying to bully me around. Then I got into wrestling and, you know, and then I moved away and it was like, okay. But in northern Idaho, it's predominantly white. Mm. So here I'm white. Up there, I'm a spick. Wow. So, yeah, it depends on I'm what the, it is. I'm the same way. So I'm me- Mexican and German. And depending on if I'm with if white people, I'm a spick. If I'm with Mexican people, then yep. I'm a, you know what I'm saying? Exactly. It's like I'm a guido. So it's like you're fucking one of, or not yep. a guido, but a freaking Ringo. honky. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's like, <laughs> One or the you other, know you mean? know. It's so funny. You don't fit in with anybody that way. Exactly. Do you ha- did you have a uh, a time like growing up where, you know, where you're training, you know, you you fought someone and you beat them up, or you kept them from beating you up? That was that really catapulted this. Like, oh, I love this, or this is something I'm going to keep going. Is there like a, a staple moment or fight that happened? I'm talking about the street, not inside the. Oh, you're talking about the street. Yeah, I'm talking about something. That no, because street fights is a completely different mentality. Mm. I, you never think about, um, yeah, you never. Street fights suck. Yeah, there, there, there's no fucking ref. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. you know. But I mean, just so you guys get an awareness of like where I come from, like with my dad. My dad was one of the guys. Like, hey, I got, I had a girlfriend in high school when I was living in Idaho. She, her and I had split up, and I was a TA, like a teacher's assistant, and I was grading papers. And she was walking through the hall, and she's like cussing at me while I'm grading papers. The door was open. Teacher wasn't wasn't in the in the room at the time and her and I go out and I said hey you need to get out of here like get I walk out to the hall and you need to get out of here I got kids in here you gotta get out of here so she starts cussing at me she slaps me well I have a couple girlfriends there in the time the high school that we were in there was theater seating but the, there was no doors that went into the that went into the classrooms so I had two of my girlfriends that were just friends mm-hmm. that they saw her slap me because they had they were looking in the hall you could look back into the hall from mm-hmm. the top desk up on the top of the, st- of the tier seating so she look, they see that happen and they walk out and they beat the shit out of her. Oh shit. So they beat her up and I didn't do anything. I was like, whatever. But anyways, I got sent home. So mm-hmm. I was like, Hey, you were part of this whole thing. You got suspended. The other two girls got suspended. The, the, my ex-girlfriend got suspended. Well, anyways, I get a call from at my house. I get home and I'm like, I told my dad, I, like, I didn't do anything, you know, this and that. I get a call from, uh, f- at my house from this guy who liked my ex-girlfriend. He's like, Hey, I'm coming over to your house. You know, we're going to fucking do this. You know, you like to, you like to push girls around, huh? You think it's funny that your girlfriends are beating her up. And this, I'm like, dude, who the fuck are you? Like, 
So we get in this altercation. He was on the phone. He's like, I'm coming to your house. So I gave him my address. <laughs> I'm like, hey, come on over. Because that's the way my dad always told me, like, hey, if you're going to fight, fucking bring yeah. it home. You know? Yeah. I'm like, oh, fuck. Let's settle so this. So yeah. he's like, yeah, call your buddies. And I was like, I got off the phone. I called my dad. I was like, hey, dad, come home. <laughs> so dad comes home from work, you know, and my dad's one of those, like, gun-toting, you know, Americans. I <laughs> just got to fucking. <laughs> so we walk, they literally three carloads of fucking kids come. Wow. My house. Holy shit. Trucks, you know, fill with the back. You know, you could still up in Idaho, you could still ride in the back of the truck. So truckloads come, you know, three cr- truckloads and cars come. You know, I've got like two or three of my buddies are there and my dad's there. And um, the kids start walking up and my dad walks out and, you know, the kid walks up and there's like a bunch of people behind him. And my dad just walks out and he's like, okay, look, and he like kind of lifts his shirt and he's like, look, you know, I got a gun. So he's like, hey, any of you guys, if anyone jumps in, you're going to get shot. Let it be a one-on-one fight and we're going to go our separate ways after the fight. And that's exactly what happened. Oh, so shit. literally me and this kid just got into a fight right in the middle of the street. Boom. Neighbors came out, watched, fucking did our fight, went our separate ways. You wow. Know, that did, was it. did they leave you alone after that? No, we, we <laughs> kind of had some issues and some, you know, confrontations after that as well, you know. But um, that's the kind of person that my, my, my family mm. was. Like, mm. even my mom is that way. Like, it was always kind of that way of like, hey, if you have an issue with me, I'll meet you at my house. We'll duke it out. When it's all said and done, it's done. Wow. Okay, move on. So, That's so the way you, it should be. So you had stuff happen to you here in San Jose, then you move over there, you had stuff happen to you. Yeah. Did this drive you and motivate you when you were wrestling and fighting to like, this is like, were you driven by that? Yeah, but at the time there was no there was no MMA. So I didn't know what it was driven by. I just didn't want to lose. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> and that was the thing. Like being, you want to ingrain your kids into being competitive. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no fucking participation trophies, man. You either win or you don't. You know, and uh, if you're not first, you're last, right, Ricky Bobby? <laughs> so, yeah. but that's that's really what I feel with these kids. Like, you should ingrain in them that you want to be the best. Because if everyone is equal, then what's the point of fucking trying to excel? Mm-hmm. Right? Do you, wow. Do you remember, like, uh, when you kind of got the itch? I know you, you mentioned the when you started getting into jiu-jitsu with your little, actually having yeah. your little brother put you in a move. But what about, like, fighting and actually, like, in situations like that? Was there a time where you're like, I, I kind of like this? Yeah, I mean, like, just so you guys know, I lost my very first fight. Like, I went, I showed up, I paid 25 bucks to fight. Oh, uh, <laughs> you paid, I paid to fight. $25 and went to this local gym. Like, you know, we took a group of guys and went to this local gym, and we pay, I paid 25 bucks to fight. And it was like, oh, okay, this is fun. It was like almost like a smoker, but mm-hmm. it was a little bit more intense because we were wearing MMA gloves, no headgear, like mouthpiece, oh, sure. like, you know, shin guards. And like, that was it, man. Like, mm-hmm. they, I, wasn't, I don't even think I was wearing a cup at the time. You know, we went out there and we fought. You know, I lost that fight, and I was like, man, maybe this isn't for me. You know, it sucks, and, uh, you know. And then I was just training, like, on a regular basis with some guys that I wrestled with in college, in North Idaho College. And uh, I got a call, like, on three days, four days' notice, and I was living in North Idaho, and they called, and the fight was down in Boise, which is in southern Idaho. And they said, hey, we want you to fight this guy. And I'm like, all right, cool. So um, how much are you going to pay? You know, if you're not going to pay, I'm not going to go. So they're like, yeah, we'll fly you down, put you in a hotel, give you 150 bucks. I'm like, fuck it. So I went down, I needed the money, I was fucking broke, you know, I mean, so I was like, all right, screw it. So I went down, fought, got a, got a knockout in like two minutes, literally within like three weeks, hey, we got this other guy. So they wanted to, they wanted to get me beat, Mm -hmm. you know, but they kept calling and they kept paying. I said, okay, well this time I want 300 and they're like, all right, fine. So then I, but I went from being the co-main event last time on three days notice. Now I'm the main event. Boom. Six second knockout, head kick. done. Because I fought a wrestler. I knew he knew he was a wrestler. All he wanted to do was wrestle me. Boom, knocked him out, done deal, ran around, like got done. After that, I was like, you know what? Maybe there's something here. We might have something. So I trained and trained, and then I moved down back down here to California and started training with Bob Cook and Frank Shamrock and at AKA and stuff. And I was like, you know, so we just kept doing I kept training and training every night. I'd work from six to like four in the afternoon, get off work in Palo Alto and just drive all the way down here. You know, and just train until like nine thirty at night, till the gym would close. Yeah, I'd have to say, you know, I was a big fan of yours in the early days. You know, when I really be, be into MMA, and you were one of the first or one of the kind of original, like true uh, mixed martial artists. Mm-hmm. You know, in those days, you had you still had a lot of pure, you know, grapplers, pure strikers, and you know, who were kind of good at the other stuff. But you seemed to be good at a lot of it. You know, you were, I would, you would knock people out or you would submit them yeah. and you seem to be good at all angles. And you said you trained with Frank. I know Frank was probably the first. I think he was the first. Yeah. So he was more of the first guy that was well rounded. And when you're around people like that, and um, it makes it easier for you to realize that you need to be well rounded. And I try to explain to people is that I'm not good at any one thing. Like, I'm not great at any one thing. Mm-hmm. I'm good at like all of them. Mm-hmm. 
You know, like I'm a good wrestler. I'm a good jujitsu guy. I'm a good stand up guy, but I'm not great at any of them. If I was to fight like a really good kickboxer, I'd fucking get mauled. Mm-hmm. You know, if I fought a really good jujitsu guy, I'd fucking get just destroyed. You know, but if I fought a good, really, a really good Olympic wrestler, I'd fucking get owned. You know what I mean? Like, but I'm really good at all of them. So when you say that, what's your thoughts on what, all the hype around McGregor and Mayweather that's been going on for quite some time? I think it's great. I, I honestly believe that it's great. I feel that he should have left the UFC out of the negotiations because it's not MMA, it's boxing. And under when he got his boxing license, it becomes under the Muhammad Ali Act. There's no reason for him to be, for the UFC to be involved in the negotiations at all. Okay, like for him. But I mean, the, with him, I feel like he's kind of a loyal guy. You see the way he is with his camp. You see the way he is with his wife and things like that. He's taking time off right now to focus on his baby was born and things mm-hmm. like that. I think that's a great thing for him. But there was no reason. He's bringing Dana along for the ride. But if Dana gets in the way, I don't think he'll have a problem saying, like, get the fuck out of the way. Mm-hmm. But during that process, he, what's going to happen, though, is that it could end up biting him in the ass because Dana's going to want a little bit more than what people don't understand. Like Dana's going to want a bigger percentage of that. So I, I give an example is that a couple of the guys that I know, I won't mention names cause I don't want to throw them under cause they're still with the organization, but a couple of guys that I know, they had had a deal done with monster energy drink and the monster said, Hey, we're going to pay you $180,000 for the year. Okay. And you're going to fight two, three times a year. We're going to pay you $180,000 for the year. You rep our brand. We're going to be, you know, one of your main sponsors. Okay. Deal was pretty much done. UFC came and said, hey, that's that's our network of sponsors that we came. They went in and said, look, we're going to negotiate the deal for you. Literally like two weeks later, the, the deal came back. The fighter got $60,000 for the year. Fuck, a third? Where'd the rest of the money go? Hmm. Where the fuck do you think it went? Yeah. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? So that's the, like when, it, when you say what are the positives and the negatives of what's going on now? That's a negative. Yeah, because <laughs> you bet. <laughs> yeah, back in the day, we used to be able to negotiate those type of things. Sure, maybe they're sponsoring, maybe they're sponsoring the UFC, but that doesn't mean that like we can't talk to them. Like right. you know, like that. What does that mean? Like when we bring our sponsors into the cage, they have to fill out the paperwork. You have all their contacts. Every time I bring a new sponsor into the cage, you get their contact information, and I know you fucking hit them up, right. and you say, "Hey, well, you know, if you want to, you want to sponsor the event, this and that, you know." Like I know those things. That was part of the problem back when they were doing the sponsors. We, our sponsors had to pay to sponsor us, even when they, even before the Reebok deal. So the way that happened was they were like, "Hey, we want to see your book." So let's just say I had Reebok as a sponsor before they were working with the UFC. They would say, "Hey." Reebok's going to sponsor you. Reebok had to fill out all this paperwork. They sent it into them. They called Reebok and the UFC would call Reebok and say, hey, well, your books say you made $1.2 million last year. You know, well, we, we believe that it would have been less had your athlete not wore your stuff into our ring, into our cage. So we think we deserve 50000 or 100000 or whatever the percentage was that they were asking for your year revenue. Wow. How the fuck are you going to get away with that? Yeah. So that's what they were doing. So companies it's just like stop. Mob. Yeah, companies yeah. stop sponsoring us because they're like, "Well, I got to pay, I got to pay the UFC fifty to hundred grand just to fucking talk to you, just to pay you, to pay you I gotta five pay them grand to pay you. <laughs> I got to pay them fucking fifty to hundred grand to turn around and pay you five grand, ten grand, hundred, you know, twenty grand, whatever it is. That's crazy, man. That was the negative at all. And then at the end, that, they did that for a couple of years. And then at the end, you turn around and slap Reebok on us and then fucking take away everything. Mm. So you got paid six, nine, whatever million dollars for like a four-year or six-year deal with Reebok. And in return, you're paying the fucking athletes peanuts. Like guys like BJ Penn made fucking 40 grand. That's it. Yeah. Dude, his deal with Ruka was fucking way better than that. I know Pat, the owner of Ruka. Mm-hmm. Okay. He's fucking always taking care of BJ. BJ and him are like fucking best buds. You know what I mean? Like BJ was the first fighter to ever like rep Ruka into the fucking cage and be like, hey, you know, like this is my boy. This is my, this is my buddy's brand. Like I'm going to do this for him. You know what I mean? Like that that's just showing loyalty to where you came from when you can't do that anymore. It's garbage. It yeah. sounds like it can't. I mean, it can, can it continue that way? If I feel like it's it's it'll fall off. You know, what I mean, it'll it'll, it'll the, the wheels will fall off. But this is what that. this is what yeah. I, I want. I we have to understand is this is that. Okay, look, the Fox deal is about to come up for renewal. Okay, the Fox mm-hmm. TV deal mm-hmm. it's about to come up for renewal. So what's going on is they sold it to um, WME, right? William Morris Entertainment is who okay. they sold it to. 
Well, the guys that they rep are also like Tom Brady and guys that, and also, um, I want to say Robert Kraft, the guy who owns the Patriots. Okay. So he's got the connection in with the NFL. So what I think they're going to do is they're going to turn around and say, like, hey, we have all these high clouded guys that now own the UFC. We're gonna we're gonna um, re ink another deal. So four point four billion is what they paid for the UFC. Now they're gonna turn around and go to the Fox and say, okay, let's re ink. Soon as they re ink the deal, they've made their money back. Mm. So they'll do another five year, seven year deal with Fox. Boom, their four point four million is already made back. Doesn't matter what they do from on. They're like, fuck, we could care less what happens to the fucking promotion now. We've made our fucking money back. Done deal. In the process, they gave right, their they money. Could have, they could have shit fighters, hardly yeah. anybody watches. They don't give a fuck. Well, then anymore. how much how much of the revenue then is uh like pay-per-view and stuff? Like how how does that work? Like so that each each fighter is negotiated differently. So like um some fighters will be like two dollars per pay-per-view buy, some fighters are one dollar per pay-per-view buy. And then it's negotiated based on like how many views. So over two hundred and fifty thousand views, you get paid a dollar. Mm-hmm. Over five hundred thousand views, you get paid two dollars. So it depends on the fighter as well. Like mm. Kane's contract will be different from DC's contract sure. and Luke's contract will be different from all three of theirs. You know, and then like mine would be different than the so rest of So how important then is like a badass agent that goes in and actually negotiates? Has nothing to do with being an agent though in the UFC. Because they don't let they, you, right? No, they don't. I mean, they do. You can have an agent, but the problem is there's no negotiation with them. Wow. That was the biggest reason mm. why these guys are fucking leaving. Yeah. They're like, there's no negotiation. When I walked in, like, let's just say this. When I walk into the UFC... And I sit down, they say, okay, look, you're a top 10 guy. Well, this is the standard for top 10 guys because they make the market when it comes to their organization. I'm going to pay you 60 and 60, 63 and 63 and like per fight, you know, and then you're going to go up. If you win, you're going to go up 66, 66, 68, 68, whatever, you know? So that's what your pay is going to go up. But if you, um, the negotiation, there is no negotiation. That's what it is. If you don't fucking like it, go fight somewhere else. <laughs> wow. And they know it. They know it. Like, hey, because every every kid growing up, their dream was to fight in the UFC, and they're gonna hold that against you. Wow. Yeah. Like, not not like, man, we're so excited to have. They definitely you. have the power. Yeah, they're, we're so excited to have you. Fucking, I'm excited to get you in the cage. It's gonna be fucking amazing. No. They're like, look, motherfucker, we're doing you a favor. You gotta, yeah. th- you gotta Sign think. You gotta think with uh, organizations like Bellator and stuff coming up and and continuing to to gain traction and grow. That sooner or later has got to get somewhat competitive. I know UFC; they want to be the NFL of of fighting, mm-hmm. and and they probably look at everybody else as like Canadian League or something like that. But it's it look it's looking like you know it's coming around. I think if Jacare and and Musashi leave, there's that. Mm-hmm. But then you also have um you know like this whole buyout. What happened was the one of the first things they did. They got rid of Matt Hughes and Chuck Liddell because they were on the payroll, Mm -hmm. and so they got rid of them. That put a bad taste in everyone's mouth, Mm -hmm. you know? And I know a lot of employees that were working for them for years, like basically from the time that the Fertitas had bought the company, they're no longer with them. Yeah, I feel like they would just buy them. You know what I mean? Like if you're an organization, you're coming up, because that's what they've they've done so far, is they'll just buy the organization and continue their their reign. They got to be careful, because they were in, they were in, I don't know if they still are, I got to actually look it up, but they were in a class action lawsuit uh, against being like basically a monopoly. Mm. And then Bellator came around and then uh, Risen started in Japan. One FC is over in China, but they were saying, Oh no, we're not, we're not a monopoly because for a moment there, after they bought strike force, it was like, we bought all of our competition. We're like, Oh, what about Bellator? <laughs> we're like, dude, fucking Bellator until Cobra got there was fucking non-existent. Yeah. No idea who was fighting. I didn't even know who the fuck their champions were. No one cared about them. You know, they were on every Friday. Did you ever fucking stay home on a Friday and watch them? <laughs> I sure the fuck didn't. And I'm a fighter. I'm like, I, I cared to see what these guys are doing. Mm-hmm. You know, so mm-hmm. it, it, it really depends on what the market provided. But they, they at the time, Bellator didn't provide any type of market to anybody. It was horrible. Wow. Dude, what, what's your prediction then? Do you see Do you see that happening? Do you see it becoming more competitive? Do you see UFC just kind of continuing to muscle people? Like, I feel like ever since that Reebok deal happened, you're, you're starting to hear a lot more backlash from it. What, what's your prediction? Well, I think the luster of the Reebok deal has gone away. Fighters now have just accepted the fact that they're going to make shit when it comes to sponsors, which is unfortunate. Um but fighters will always do that. You want to know why? Because they came from a background like mine where they just don't have money. Wow. Like it, that's, that's a where great I try. Point. It's so hard. It's so hard for. Yeah, because you're pulling. You're t- you're yeah. pulling from a pool of people who, 
Like nobody, like you, you rarely will you see someone who comes from like super wealthy upbringing and kind of has everything done for them, or they're like, yeah, I want to fight professionally. It usually doesn't happen that way. Are there any top fighters like that? I actually don't. Are there some? Was it BJ Penn? Was like that? BJ yeah. was like that. Stage North Club was like that. Yeah. Uh, okay. But you said top fighters, so I don't want to. No, just BJ. Penn. But yeah. BJ Penn. <laughs> Yeah. So B- BJ's B- rare too because he was actually a br- he was a fighter. Like yeah, you're like, why brawler. is this guy fighting like yeah. this? You know. Yeah, but the other thing too as well is like his brothers were all very active in jujitsu. You know, so uh, BJ was the first American black belt to ever win worlds. Yeah, yeah. So and then his brothers though were all really good. Like his brother was a blue belt. And when his brother was a blue belt, he won worlds. Okay. Uh, his brother JD was fucking. Je- fun- he his brother JD was actually probably the most, the most, uh fighter fighter out of all of them really and he had a real bad neck injury oh. so he just just couldn't get to a whole get through a whole camp and actually fight but man that guy was a fucking savage on the on the floor oh, wow. insane man yeah fight sports in general have that history even boxing you know uh has that history where you see these fighters coming up you and need just that getting... grit dude and it's i'm, I'm well, that's sorry why, like, who you, chooses to fight if you, you were know? growing up and you've had it, a lot of things handed to you even if you got great parents i'd feel like that's a, it's tough to install that grit that you need you know well these guys are pulling from a market of guys that just they don't they don't have anything and the ones that don't have anything they're going to do whatever it is let me give you an example so I don't know the well-offness of like Clay Guida, mm-hmm. okay? But when he, when him and I had fought, there was a couple of deals where I was talking with some sponsors for them to sponsor me. And when they were sponsoring, they said, yeah, well, look, we're going to sponsor Clay as well. They're like, look, we're, all we're doing for him is closing a banner. I'm like, fuck no, I fought in the UFC, I fought in Pride. No fucking way I'm only letting you give me clothes and banner. Mm-hmm. I got enough fucking clothes. You pay me, en- <laughs> you pay me enough, I'll buy my own damn clothes. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that wasn't me. But that's the thing. You're pulling from guys that like, they really don't have much. Yeah. So when they don't have much, they'll do whatever it takes to get what it, their foot in the door. You know, so like, sure, you want to give me clothes? You want to give me supplements? You know, you want to give me a year of supplements? I'm like, I don't do that. I buy my own fucking supplements. You know, you pay me enough money, I'll buy my own shit. Mm-hmm. You know yeah. what I mean? And that's what that's what fighters don't seem to understand. They'll lowball stuff to get it done because they don't have the money at the time. Yeah. So they're like, what, you're going to make my banner? Well, a banner costs like 600 bucks to make. Right. You know, if you go to a, a print shop, it costs like 600 bucks to make. So it's like unfortunate that these kids, they don't, they're like, I don't have the money to make the banner, but I can't make, I can't make money. If, if I don't have a banner, so right. what do I do? You know, so you have this company uh, make yeah. a banner for you, you know, you, you, you get supplements from them, whatever it is, you know, to get you through your next camp because you can't afford to buy supplements because they didn't fucking pay you. You know, instead, you should have taken the money. It's very similar. Uh, you know, I don't know how familiar you are with the whole bodybuilding, men's physique, bikini world right now that's exploding, right? And I, mm-hmm. because I was a diehard fan of UFC and I watched that whole growth of that the transition with Reebok and then I was somebody who uh you know got into you know bodybuilding or men's physique and got up to the professional level and then realized like holy shit it's very very similar and you have these big companies they come in and they prey on all of them yeah. and they know they have all this leverage that this kid just wants to be on a cover of a magazine so fucking bad and just wants to say he's sponsored so bad like they take it's like such a big deal just to say you're sponsored because yeah. they and put it in your bio here yeah like, I'm sponsored by and the so-and-so. sponsorships take advantage of it so they give these kids like some t-shirts and like 20 percent commission on what they sell and it's like oh my god the markup on supplements like 400 percent as it is so you're giving them like a a percentage to hustle their supplements and some free shirts like and it's just it's it's turning into this culture where you know all these kids are trying so hard to get involved and then they get in it and they don't realize like oh shit just getting here doesn't make me a millionaire or make me rich forever it's the the rules of supply and demand always uh it's just that's just what they are and i you know you blew my mind right now when you said you know they're, they're, they're pulling from these kids who grew up with nothing who this is their opportunity this is their one opportunity to succeed at life or to do something for themselves because they don't have any other opportunities. So you have a supply, a large supply of these kids who are like, I'll fucking do anything. And it's just the way it is. If only they knew, right? Yep. And you're not even, see, like, I feel that the bikini stuff or the whatever, the yeah, body, yeah. that's more of an American based thing. I mean, sure, I'm sure that it's worldwide, but I'm saying it's more of a, you're pulling from fighters. They're, they're, it's worldwide. Yeah. You're taking guys from Sweden, guys from the Philippines, Germany and Philippines, you know, China, everywhere, because they fucking don't have anywhere, anything. You're pulling from guys that literally, some of them live in third world countries, you know, but all they want to do is train and be an athlete. Sure, they want free shirts. Sure, they want supplements. They're like, they don't have no fucking clue how to yeah. use the supplements or what they're doing. You know, like part of when I brought in Dan Leith to come in and live with me, he's like, okay, look, 
I was like, when, he's like, when are you taking this? When are you taking this? When I told him all the stuff I was telling him what I was taking and what times he's like, okay, well look, you can't take this during this time because you're actually, it's counteracting what you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. Now you give that to someone who has no fucking clue. that has no education on any of it. And I've been doing this my whole life. And I <laughs> thought this was the way it was supposed to be done. And he's like, comes in and sits me down and goes, this isn't right. No, like you're, you're actually hurting yourself when you actually drink this before the workout. Mm. Then you're hurting yourself when you drink this or eat this right after your workout. You should be putting more of this in your body. And I'm thinking to myself, these young kids, they don't have a fucking chance. They don't have, I mean, like people that just, they come from, whether they came, I'm not going to say ghetto, but they, they're coming from like a, 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 a family that's just not times. supportive. Yeah, hard times. Exactly, hard times. So they're coming from an area that's hard, where they have hard times and they have no idea. And, mm-hmm. you know, they, they're they probably in their household. There was never supplements well, or protein on the counter. Well, fighters forever, even even when you go back to boxing, like they, they're just notorious for, you know, doing their career in fighting and then afterwards just being like broke or bankrupt. You know, the, like the old, like the like the old uh, bodybuilder. Uh, excuse me, not bodybuilder. The old boxer who owns the bar, and that's what he does now. And he used to be a champion, but now he just owns a bar and he doesn't make any money because they don't understand that that whole process. Like, yeah. uh, you know, may, that might be some good advice. You know, God, how it, who's you, the, who's the one who's the boxer that uh, quit and said no moss? Mm, I don't know. No, no that was uh, yeah in the middle uh, of his fight. Yeah, no more. He said no moss. He said no more. Oh man, it's not, twice now you did a name that I should. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I watched so, it. I'll and, look it up. But him, so he's like he made he made millions of dollars. He turns around, he goes home, and he basically put all that money back into his country, and people just took it from him, took it from him. I mean, he's a legend there in his, you know, in his uh, in his country. But it's was like it he, Roberto Duran? Roberto yes. Duran. Yeah. So Duran. So he's made all this millions of dollars. He put it all back into trying to help people that were in need, and you know, giving money to the government, giving money to like people that were helping. Now he's broke. Fucking dead broke, literally. But he's like a fucking huge celebrity superstar over there. So he doesn't really pay for anything. But he lives in like a total shithole. But he still lives in his his original town. His, mm-hmm. He lives at home. In I wonder country. if he made any money off the the Netflix. Just by the way, that's a great Netflix documentary. If you haven't seen it, Roberto Durant's. Uh, I'll check it out. It's bad. Seen it. Yeah, it's really good. It's really really good. And I'm I wonder now that you say that if he even made any money off of that or not. I saw that. I think I saw the. Tr- no, it wasn't a true Hollywood story. What the hell was it? Um, like, a, <laughs> like a thirty for thirty or something yeah. on it. Maybe mm-hmm. it was a shorter version of the documentary. I'm trying to think what the documentary. It's not. It's not named after him. It's called. Uh, I'll look it up. And I'll, I'll. I'll put it in the show notes for those of you guys okay. that are listening right now. So it's. It was awesome. It was a great documentary. I watched mm-hmm. it maybe just a month ago, which is why I was surprised I couldn't fucking think of the name when you said that. I yeah. should have known that. Now, do you do uh, things on the side, business for yourself? Uh, what how, What are you involved in besides fighting, or is or is it connected all uh, through fighting? It's kind of all connected through fighting but there's a couple other things that I do you know right now like I'm just starting a podcast as well we started oh, it's called deal. Sammy and the Punk so we do it um, we do it's I think we're, we just filmed number 18 on Tuesday okay so we, we try to do one a week just for right now to get our feet wet um, we've done a couple times where we've done twice a week depending on the fight so I interviewed like Khabib uh, Nurmagomedov I've interviewed you know DC and these guys so I do a couple things uh, Shane Faison who does fight tips and I've done some other stuff you know with Dan Leith Lockhart Leith the nutritionist who helped me help me and DC mm-hmm. and those guys so anyways um, yeah, I do. I do that. It's called Sammy the Punk. You can on YouTube and iTunes. But then I also do. Um, I own a gym here in San Jose, and uh, I do strictly for mom and pops. I'm not looking for fighters. I don't want fighters in the gym. Like it's actually kind of bad for business. Oh, wow. And uh, yeah, hmm. because people come in, they get intimidated. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know. Um, and the reason why I know this is because years we we used to train during a class at AKA we would all the fighters would come in and there'd be an eleven o'clock class and we would train it was like eleven thirty class or a noon class. We would train the same time some of the students were in there. When you got fighters in there beating each other up and yelling and cussing each other like, fuck you. Yeah. Kick your fucking ass. Yeah. You know, and like you because they we get, we get <laughs> right heated, on. man. There's some young young kid coming into your first class. You're like, oh, I don't know if I'm ready for this. Sparring gets fucking yeah. heated, you know? Like there's times we throw the gloves off and we're like, let's go! <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it's 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 for real, man. So I mean, there's times I've literally like with Mike Kyle, Paul Bonatello, I've thrown the gloves off and just tried throwing down with them for real. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Seriously. Like we're kicking our shin guards off. I'm gonna fucking kill you. <laughs> you know? And it's, so it's for real. But I mean, like we realized then that the class used to be full at AKA at noon and then it went from like 25 people to like six. Wow. And so Javier, the owner of AKA, was like, yeah, like we're going to move the fighting around. We're going to switch that class. The fighter train's going to be at this time. And, you know, 
And then I realized that it was just wasn't good for business. That, I bet you there's a lot of people that don't think about that. I, well, I've never even put, put well, that together. think about it in a gym, dude. Is a freaking hardcore maniac like power lifters and bodybuilders and shit, is that good necessarily for the average person? No, you're no. right. Yeah, yeah. Because that's, no, everybody's that's leave. part of why yeah. a lot of people don't even like gyms like Gold's, right? It, it definitely appeals to yeah. a certain demographic of people yeah. that, which is not your average Jane or Joe trying to lose 30 pounds of think, fat. Think about all the YouTube videos that have gone viral. Right about people making fun of the people that, uh, uh, exactly. you know, it's because people it makes it's people t- uncomfortable. <laughs> it makes, it makes people uncomfortable. Yeah. It makes people feel like, man, that guy's so dude weird. in the gym. In That's this- what created Planet Fitness. Yeah, right? yeah. exactly. <laughs> Fuck, in man. the gym business, if you, uh, they're the worst customers. I'll tell you why. Because they use your gym like crazy, <laughs> so they put a yeah. shit ton of wear and tear on your equipment. They they pay their membership fee religiously, but it's cheap because the whole model is designed around getting people to not show up, mm-hmm. and then they're loud as hell and they're big and muscular and intimidating and so it's like you don't want those people if you're going to have that kind of model otherwise you charge a lot of money and then you have fewer members and you know whatever well, fighters are there every day they exactly. never they, they, they never try to pay yeah. so like they don't pay their membership religiously because they don't have money <laughs> so they don't pay so then they're always trying to get something for free like oh i didn't bring my gloves or i don't have a mouthpiece can i borrow some is there any loners like yeah. you know like i literally we've had a fight one fighter came in from another um from another state He's like, yeah, I didn't bring my mouthpiece. You guys got any loner mouthpieces? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, loner mouthpiece? Like, yeah, we got one already pre-molded to somebody else's teeth. You want to try that one on? See if it fits? <laughs> <laughs> you know? oh, so, man. so I own a gym here in San Jose called Knox Martial Arts and Fitness. And what I do is I work with like kid athletes as well as adults. Cool. But it's mainly like, um, like I, the, right before I came today, I was working with um, a little girl who's on a soccer, tra- like a traveling team for soccer. Awesome. So I do sports and agility for them, things like that. Um, for the younger kids, I try not for myself. I try not to do personal training with adults because I feel like the the dedication's not there as much as a as a kid that's an athlete mm-hmm. who really wants it. You know, the other thing too is I feel like I've had enough experience in life in general how to try and get the most out of a kid athlete, and it seems like it works. Like I have a really good uh, jujitsu program for kids, and um, it's pretty big. And the that's kid, awesome. Where are you guys located? All, yeah, so we're on that? Pearl and Branham right there. There's like a Wiener Schnitzel right there in the parking Holy lot. Holy shit, dude! You're right by me. Yeah. yeah. So mm. I'm right there on Pearl. And I'm Branham. bringing my kid by. There you go. Oh, oh that's excellent. So yeah. I'm right there on the corner. Um, it used to be like an old gaming thing. I've been there for about three years. And um, it's been great, man. I'm right next to Fire Station 13. I know exactly where you My boys, man, the boys over there are always looking out for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, no, it's been great, man. Like, uh, we've How long have you guys three, been open? Three years. Oh, wow. And it's going so, good? It's going well. Like, we had uh, the first year was, fuck, it was rough, man. Yeah. It was rough. Imagine. It was rough, you know? So it's just trying to get the, trying to get, and I didn't realize how hard it was to have employees. Mm. <laughs> man, it's so rough. You know, you just, you, you got to find the right vibe and the right fit. And I've got a great group of people now that are there and it's like, I can trust them and rely on them. And, you know, and we got through the hard times together in the beginning. Like now I'm, we got the ones that weren't meant to be are gone. The ones that are here, they're here. It seems like they're here to stay. And I really love that. Excellent. Right? I want to hear about like, who do you, who's like the toughest fight or t- toughest fighter you've ever had to fight? <sighs> okay. So there's a couple things. So there's one person that, like we talked about, like, when did you know? Yeah. Okay. The one fight was against Hermes Franca. Okay. I had won. That was my second UFC fight. I had won uh, the first two rounds. In the third round, the very beginning, all I had to do was just stick and stay away. And he threw a kick against the cage, and I caught the kick. And the guy was known for power. Like, he had just beat Carl Uno the fight before. He, you know, he had some big wins. He beat Herm- he beat uh, Eves Edwards. And he, I caught the kick. And he had some power, so he just threw like a loopy punch, caught me right on the button and dropped me. And he beat the shit out of me for about three and a half minutes. Like literally, there was a couple times where the ref was going to jump in, didn't jump in, and you know, anyways, so he, he, I, I beat him the first two rounds. The third round, for three and a half minutes, he kicked the shit out of me. Mm-hmm. Like to the point where I look like fucking elephant man afterwards. <laughs> but... The last minute of the fight, he had gassed himself trying to finish me, so I was able to get my bearings back about me and finish the fight harder than he did, which I felt made it a ten a, a ten nine round because now they're talking about making sure. ten eight rounds more uh, more prevalent. Like they're going to make them happen more often, but back then they didn't. So I survived that round and I ended up winning a split decision, which was amazing for me. But that was the fight that I'm going to tell you right now. That was the fight that I knew I was a fighter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That was the one fight where I looked down at my fucking, I said, dude, there's no fucking way I'm losing this fight. I always wondered, because honestly, as a kid growing up, I always wanted, it's one thing to beat somebody up on the street. 
Okay. Cause you're fighting someone that has no fucking experience. They're probably drunk too, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. So it's one thing to beat those guys up, you know, and think that you're the man, but you're not the fucking man. Okay. So when I, when I got into a fight against somebody that was really good, it was a jitsu black belt, fucking subbed everybody, like super entertaining, heavy hands, you know, and experience fought the best guys. We were considered one, two, and three, me, him, and Eves Edwards at the time in the world. And so when I'm fighting him and he drops me and I come back and I finish the round harder than him, in my mind, I'm thinking to myself, you were made out for this. This is, this is what awesome. you're, this is what it's about. Like when I see these other guys that are, and I, and just so we're clear, you know how much I made for that fight? Hmm. $8,000. Oh, okay. I made 4,000 and 4,000. So had I lost or it had been a draw, four I would have made four grand. But at the time, Forget to me, the shit beat out of you for three minutes. But to <laughs> me, to me, that was fuck. That was amazing, man. Really? I had no money at the time. Wow. Like my rent, I was living in. And there's another story, but I was living in a porn warehouse. Oh, what? I was, what? A, I was <laughs> living in a porn warehouse. How did we miss this? Yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. What do you mean a porn warehouse? I was living in a warehouse where the guy that like owned the dildo warehouse. Dildo mania. Yeah, exactly. Sweet. He used to sell. He used to sell. He used to buy and sell and trade uh, porn from this warehouse. So he would buy um, like old 60s, 70s, 80s porn magazines, videos, DVDs, cassettes, everything. And he would buy and sell them on eBay. So he'd pick up like the old Nina Hartley DVD oh, and, he, and like he'd hold on to it for a year and he'd turn around and sell it again for like triple the money that he bought it for. Holy shit. But it was like crates and crates of, of stacked porn inside the this warehouse. So you just had an endless supply. Endless supply. Demand. Endless <laughs> supply. Sweet. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Anytime your friends need, must have loved you. Anytime I need to cop a jerk, bro, I just walked downstairs, <laughs> fucking pulled the helmet off real quick, and came back. It's <laughs> the greatest ever. Oh, oh my god, hands down. Excellent. I think you have to be. I, I up until this moment, I thought Sal was the most versed in porn. But yeah, yeah, I'm sure Bring you up, can. You know, Hartley, I mean, I'm like, yeah. I, you probably go all the way back I'm, to the 20s. Yeah, yeah, old like, school, baby. Oh old school. God. Gotta go back. Oh my yeah, god. Old so, porn. I used to live in this porn warehouse. I paid $150 a month to live in this warehouse. So when I made four grand, I was like, man, I could pay my rent for two, three years easily. <laughs> I, I ain't fucking ever moving out of this porn warehouse. But it was the funniest thing ever. But at the time, I only made, you know, four grand. But that was the fight, though, that made me feel like I was a fighter. Yeah. yeah. You know? Um, and then um, later on in my career, just uh, a couple of years ago, when I fought Tony Ferguson, that was another fight. Mm. Like, you see these guys, I got cut up real bad in the fight. I mean, I had like fucking Mercedes signs on my head, you know, from different cuts, you know, and I have a nasty cut here on my head here. And uh, I literally got, I got stitched up in the back and it was, took probably about two hours for him to stitch me all the way up. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah, it was, it was nasty blood coming down my face. Like, I just, I look like a, just, I was like, I jumped in fucking blood, just all red, wow. you know, the whole fight. But there was never a moment in that fight that I was like, fucking just give up. Never, mm -hmm. never, you know. So that's got to feel good. No, and that's the thing is, you, you, I don't know. Like, if you give away participation trophies, and I'm gonna go back on this, is because then the kid doesn't feel the need to go on. Of he can just give up and then move on to the next thing. Because yes, next time I'm gonna get a, another trophy. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I feel bad for the kids that don't ever get to the point where they really earn the first, second, and third place. But I feel that it's important for kids growing up. If you're, if you're condoning mediocrity then they're never going to excel at anything else they want to do well it doesn't translate into real fucking life you ever gone to a job where they like, yeah you get, uh, you get paid the same as the guy that's outperforming you showed you? up yeah because yeah, yeah. you should no you it just doesn't, doesn't work that way it's not real life yeah i just everyone's in this feel good life you know and i don't i feel like like you said life's not that way you know, but it's it's sad to see because i think this is what's developing our younger generation i think and if you want to develop our if you want the the strength of a strong country, you need to develop the younger generation mm -hmm. right now. I feel like the ones that are already in college, kind of a lost cause already. They're done. You got to start moving on to the kids that are literally are like in elementary school, in, uh, intermediate school. You can still save them in high school, I think. You know, you get into that point where I think you can still save them like, hey, let's be the best. Let's be the best at everything we do. And I'm all for the do what you want to do as long as you love it. If you want to be broke, be broke as long as you're doing what you love. I'm all for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, but then don't do what you love and be broke and then turn around and complain that you think your college should be paid for or you should get, you know, everything for free, everything for free. That to me is not, they're not the same thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can't say I want to be broke and do what I love, but then want someone else to take care of you while you do what you love. That doesn't work that way. Yeah. I actually had an argument with someone about that the other day where they, they were just, they were, we were talking about college and 
uh, they were saying how, you know, I, and I was explaining to them like, well, okay, here's how, you know, first of all, it's never free. Somebody's paying for it. So mm-hmm. whether it's taxed or whether you pay for it yourself, but they were talking about how, you know, it's not fair that someone with a like liberal arts degree, uh, you know, is not going to make as much as someone with an engineering degree or whatever. And I'm like, what do you mean it's not fair? Like, yeah. that's just, that's just the way it is. Where's and, the demand for that? Yeah. And if you're, if you're going to, you know, try and get a loan to go to school, like it only makes sense that, uh, that the bank should tell you. Hey, look! I know the degree you're going to get. You're not going to be able to pay us back, so we ain't going to, we can't give you the money for that because you're getting a degree in something that's not going to make you any money. That's just the way life works. Look, life is life is a choice to be successful, to not be successful. If you decide you don't want to be successful, that's your problem. You chose liberal arts, right? I didn't fucking choose it for you. Yeah. Your parents didn't choose it for you. You chose it, which means you obviously were either one of two things: you really care for liberal arts. Or you were just looking to get a fucking degree and move on with life. Mm-hmm. So one of the two things happened, right? Like you were just looking for the, the the quick degree, the easiest degree. You could get your parents off your back and move on with life, thinking you're gonna get paid outside of that. Now that I got a g- degree, but what what is it? Right. Like at one point, at one point, I don't know where where this happened, but we started telling people like, you know, it's all about just finding your purpose and what you love. And if you find your purpose and what you love, that's all that matters. So then you have this generation that's that's doing that. But then when they they find out what what their purpose and what they love to do doesn't pay a lot of money, they get pissed off and they think, well, I should be able to get paid that as much as that guy because he fights and he found his purpose. I don't desire I don't desire to do that. I desire to teach and do this. So why don't we get paid equally? But then it's, it's not a desire anymore, though. Right. Mm-hmm. Like if it, it's not something you love, then if you're if you're not okay with getting paid ah. peanuts, it's not you're not doing it for love anymore. Right. I literally paid twenty five bucks to fight my right. first fight because I fucking loved fighting and training. That's a great point. I love like the one thing I'm gonna miss the most when I retire is being in that fucking locker room with the guys, being out on the mat with the guys, training with those guys. The the shit talking, like the shit we're doing right now. Mm-hmm. This is what I'm gonna miss the most, man. Mm-hmm. Like. I'm sure like when you guys were to wrap this up and be like, man, fuck, what are we going to do now? Like, you're going to miss this. You're going to miss the, the, all the shit you guys. Well, the good thing through. about what we do is yeah. we just talk. So I can, yeah. I can do this. For no, you. no, but I'm saying <laughs> you're, you're right. You're, you yeah, guys can do yeah. it forever, but let's just say I like, know, yeah, Hey, right. if you yeah. decide to do another show or like someone's got, someone no, no, went, you're so, we you talk know about, I mean? like, like, we yeah. talk about this all the time. Yeah. We talk about it all the time and, and, and realizing that. And if you're truly passionate about it, then it isn't about the money. It isn't about all those things. You said it best right there. You paid to do your fight. Yeah. And you know what? Something like a liberal, and I know we're picking on liberal, liberal arts right now, but I, no, I just, I just randomly picked it, but like my sister got a degree in like anthropology. Horniculture. Well, no, yeah. my sister got a degree in anthropology, there's for example, for and she's like, "There's not much I can do with that besides, you know, be a, you know, a professor. So I have to go get the PhD or work in a museum, or there's not much I can do with it." So she actually went and started learning some other stuff. But that's just that's just the reality. And like you said, like if you really love it, then just do it. And but understand that you know, some things are going to pay more than others and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, yep. just do what you love and, and be okay with it. What people don't seem to understand is that doing what you love means extra hustle because like I love training kids, but I also don't want to have to go out there and hustle to get kids to come to my camps or get kids to come to my gym. I feel like, oh, I've worked enough to be a fighter. I want the, I want the people just to come to me. It doesn't work that way, man. As much as I would love for that to happen, I've like, I've got to market on, you know, on social media. I've got to market in, you know, on, on Google. I've got to do these things. Otherwise, no one's going to ever hear about it. People, you have to hustle. Mm-hmm. You got to put the work in. I got to put door flyers on, you know, and you got to do it, man. You got to walk around the neighborhoods that you're in and be like, hey, you know, I give you a free pass for the day or two pass for the day, whatever it is. You know what I mean? You got to be that guy walking because if you hire some kid to do it, he's going to take all those flyers you spent, you know, $1,000 on, throw them in the trash and collect his, oh, it took me three hours to drop all those and collect his $100, you Dude, know, for the shit. three I hours. I hate that shit. You know what I mean? So yeah. you, you got to hustle. If you want to do what you love and you want people to recognize you for doing what you love, you need to hustle doing it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. What is it? What is it now? What is it moving forward? What, what does it look like for you? You know, um, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see what happens. Realistically, like moving forward, we'll see what happens. Um, How long do you plan I, on fighting for? I don't know if I'm going to fight again. That's up in the air. I'm not making any decisions like under, you know, emotional circumstances. I want to make sure that I take my time to really think about it. The other thing as well is like, as far as me fighting again, I fought already once this year. If I fight again, I mean, realistically, a whole five 
paycheck goes to taxes. Mm-hmm. So what's the point? You know, you make a certain amount of money and then I'm going to pay. Basically, if I fight another one, I put my body through a whole camp. I fight again. I pay that. Almost that whole check goes to taxes. Now, what do you, why do you say that? Is that because you've established yourself in a business for yourself with a school and you're, you're making a living off of mm-hmm. that? And then basically the amount of money you would make off of a purse is well, there's, when just you make put a, you in a new bracket. Yeah, when you put you in a new bracket, you make a you make a certain amount, pretty much like three quarters of it. But, well, I try to break it down for athletes, right? I feel like athletes should have a different tax bracket. They should have a different tax, the way their taxes are done. Because look, let's just say, and, I'm, and of course I'm biased because I'm an athlete, mm-hmm. but if you take what I make and then I pay, let's just say I pay 38.6% or 38.8% or mm-hmm. whatever in taxes, right? Then I give 20% to my agent, 20% to my trainers. What am I left with? Wow. So why? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Nothing. Crickets. You know, it's crickets. Yeah, exactly. So that's what people don't seem to understand. And I make all this money, right? You make all this money. You make so much money. Yeah, but you got to pay your taxes, man. Like, you know, (laughs) like not just taxes, but I got to pay my agent. I got to pay my trainers. I got to pay my coaches. Yeah, you got to make smart business decisions. Yeah, you got to make smart business. So and what I try to tell people is like, look, if they have the money left over, they're going to turn like for me, I would have, I would have probably opened another gym. I would have hired more people. If I had more money that I could do things with, someone who, like myself, like for me anyways, I can't speak for all athletes, but for someone like me, I want to open more gyms, more businesses. I want to do more things. Cool. Start a podcast. Do that. But things like this cost money. You guys know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You guys mm-hmm. built this up. This is amazing. I walked in the room like, gosh, damn. Yeah. You know, there's a green screen right here. Fuck, you guys can see this shit. It's pretty dope. Yeah. You now know what I mean? Now just to so, use it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you guys understand what I mean, yeah. right? Yeah, like for sure. It's, you, you've got to... You, if I had more money to um, do things with, I would do more. I feel like I would do more good. You know, you mm-hmm. have more camps for kids during the summer. I would, I would uh, build more programs for kids. I'd be able to give a little bit more at my gym. Like, hey, you know, this parent has three kids here. Instead of charging them one fifty a kid, I'll charge you like eighty nine a kid. You know, like, and then you you cut them. You cut whatever my cost is on my geese. You know, I give you whatever it is my cost on my geese. You know, like instead of charging them more for the up for the markup. I, one thing is it's hard for parents who have multiple kids to put them all in sports. So expensive. Super expensive. Yeah, super expensive, right? So I think it's up to the athletes that have been there and done that and been in the places that we've been is to try and help give back and give back in the way that you can by just your donating your time, you know, giving your time to your community. It's very cool that you have a perspective like that because – you know, even you talking about making more money, you translate that in the ability for me to give more, you know? Well, look, I don't make it, to, I, I make, I make good money, but like when I, I was, I was in this juvenile hall here in San Jose when I was a kid, you know, I got in a fight at school at middle school and I, I got put in that juvenile hall. So now what I do is randomly every, say once every year, once every six months, whenever I can, one of my friends is one of the, one of the sheriffs there that works there. He walks me in and I just walk around in the pods and talk to the kids. Really? Yeah. Oh, and I'll, ta- I'll great, take my, man. I'll take my world title belt with me too. And I'll be like, Hey dude, I, I grew up. And when I tell the kids that I grew up on the East side of San Jose, they're like in shock. They're like, no way. Get the <laughs> fuck out of <laughs> here. You know? And I'll, sometimes I'll bring like a highlight video or whatever, me fighting like here, Walking out in an arena filled with twenty thousand people. I fought in Japan, forty three thousand people. That's awesome. It's fucking insane, right? That's awesome. awesome. New Year's Eve in Japan, you know, fifty thousand people, fifty two thousand or whatever. And New Year's Eve in Japan, I walk out and this crowd's fucking enormous. I'm just like looking around. I mean, like I was in awe myself. You know what I mean? It's crazy. But you think about you tell a kid that's in juvenile hall who just feels like this is where my life's gonna be, and you show him a video like that and say, I grew up on the same streets you did. You know, and they're like, oh, well, you had this. You know, I'm like, no, I didn't have any of that. Yeah. I just mm-hmm. did it. I just yeah. literally got rid of all my other friends. I didn't get rid of them. They weeded themselves out when I just kept going to the gym every day and training and they were no longer around. They're like, uh, they just thought they lost my number. Mm-hmm. Bro, you lived in a porn warehouse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah if that's not closing <laughs> enough, right? I mean, that, I'm sold right there. I'm this like, whole what? conversation, that's you, the one thing he's going to leave. Yeah. Like, <laughs> motherfucker <laughs> paid his first fight and he lived in a porn warehouse for 150 he can't bucks get a out month. Of his head like, now. fuck you. No. You can do it, man. Because yeah. you can recycle enough cans to pay for that, you know exactly. what I'm saying, every month. That's fucking great. Well, good deal, man. It's been good talking to you, brother. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Thank you very much. Listen, uh, mindpumpmedia.com. Go there, sign up. It's free. 30 days of coaching. Still free. You can also find us on Instagram at Mind Pump Media. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal. Justin's at Mind Pump Justin. And Adam is at Mind Pump Adam. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. 
The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.